An Answer to the Question, What is Enlightenment? By Immanuel Kant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Koenigsberg in Prussia, 30th September, 1784. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another. This immaturity is self-incurred if its cause is not lack of understanding, but lack of resolution and courage to use it without the guidance of another. The motto of enlightenment is therefore sapere auda, have courage to use your own understanding. Laziness and cowardice are the reasons why such a large proportion of men, even when nature has long emancipated them from alien guidance, natura liter majorenis, nevertheless gladly remain immature for life. For the same reasons, it is all too easy for others to set themselves up as their guardians. It is so convenient to be immature. If I have a book to have understanding in place of me, a spiritual adviser to have a conscience for me, a doctor to judge my diet for me, and so on, I need not make any efforts at all. I need not think so long as I can pay. Others will soon take the tiresome job over for me. The guardians who have kindly taken upon themselves the work of supervision will soon see to it that by far the largest part of mankind, including the entire fair sex, should consider the step forward to maturity not only as difficult, but also as highly dangerous. Having first infatuated their domesticated animals, and carefully prevented the docile creatures from daring to take a single step without the leading strings to which they are tied, they next show them the danger which threatens them if they try to walk unaided. Now this danger is not in fact so very great, for they would certainly learn to walk eventually after a few falls. But an example of this kind is intimidating, and usually frightens them off from further attempts. Thus it is difficult for each separate individual to work his way out of the immaturity which has become almost second nature to him. He has even grown fond of it, and is really incapable, for the time being, of using his own understanding, because he was never allowed to make the attempt. Dogmas and formulas, those mechanical instruments for rational use, or rather misuse, of his natural endowments, are the ball and chain of his permanent immaturity. And if anyone did throw them off, he would still be uncertain about jumping over even the narrowest of trenches, for he would be unaccustomed to free movement of this kind. Thus only a few, by cultivating their own minds, have succeeded in freeing themselves from immaturity, and in continuing boldly on their way there is more chance of an entire public enlightening itself. This is indeed almost inevitable, if only the public concerned is left in freedom. For there will always be a few who think for themselves, even among those appointed as guardians of the common mass. Such guardians, once they have themselves thrown off the yoke of immaturity, will disseminate the spirit of rational respect for personal value, and for the duty of all men to think for themselves. The remarkable thing about this is that if the public, which was previously put under this yoke by the guardians, is suitably stirred up by some of the latter who are incapable of enlightenment, it may subsequently compel the guardians themselves to remain under the yoke. For it is very harmful to propagate prejudices, because they finally avenge themselves on the very people who first encouraged them, or whose predecessors did so. Thus a public can only achieve enlightenment slowly. A revolution may well put an end to autocratic despotism, and to rapacious or power-seeking oppression, but it will never produce a true reform in ways of thinking. Instead, new prejudices, like the ones they replaced, will serve as a leash to control the great unthinking mass. For enlightenment of this kind, all that is needed is freedom and the freedom in question is the most innocuous form of all, the freedom to make public use of one's reason in all matters. But I hear on all sides the cry, Don't argue. The officer says, Don't argue, get on parade. The tax official, 
Don't argue, pay. The clergyman, don't argue, believe. Only one ruler in the world says, argue as much as you like and about whatever you like, but obey. All this means restrictions on freedom everywhere. But which sort of restriction prevents enlightenment, and which, instead of hindering it, can actually promote it? I reply, the public use of man's reason must always be free, and it alone can bring about enlightenment among men. The private use of reason may quite often be very narrowly restricted, however, without undue hindrance to the progress of enlightenment. But by the public use of one's own reason, I mean that use which anyone may make of it as a man of learning addressing the entire reading public. What I term the private use of reason is that which a person may make of it in a particular civil post or office with which he is entrusted. Now, in some affairs which affect the interests of the commonwealth, we require a certain mechanism whereby some members of the commonwealth must behave purely passively, so that they may, by an artificial common agreement, be employed by the government for public ends, or at least deterred from vitiating them. It is, of course, impermissible to argue in such cases. Obedience is imperative. But in so far as this or that individual, who acts as part of the machine, also considers himself as a member of a complete commonwealth, or even of cosmopolitan society, and thence as a man of learning who may, through his writings, address a public in the truest sense of the word, he may indeed argue without harming the affairs in which he is employed for some of the time in a passive capacity. Thus it would be very harmful if an officer receiving an order from his superiors were to quibble openly, while on duty, about the appropriateness or usefulness of the order in question. He must simply obey. But he cannot reasonably be banned from making observations as a man of learning on the errors in the military service, and from submitting these to his public for judgment. The citizen cannot refuse to pay the taxes imposed upon him. Presumptuous criticisms of such taxes, where someone is called upon to pay them, may be punished as an outrage which could lead to general insubordination. Nonetheless, the same citizen does not contravene his civil obligations if, as a learned individual, he publicly voices his thoughts on the impropriety or even injustice of such fiscal measures. In the same way, a clergyman is bound to instruct his pupils and his congregation in accordance with the doctrines of the church he serves, for he was employed by it on that condition. But as a scholar, he is completely free, as well as obliged, to impart to the public all his carefully considered, well-intentioned thoughts on the mistaken aspects of those doctrines, and to offer suggestions for a better arrangement of religious and ecclesiastical affairs. And there is nothing in this which need trouble the conscience. What he teaches in pursuit of his duties, as an active servant of the church, is presented by him as something which he is not empowered to teach at his own discretion, but which he is employed to expound in a prescribed manner and in someone else's name. He will say, Our church teaches this or that, and these are the arguments it uses. He then extracts as much practical value as possible for his congregation from precepts to which he would not himself subscribe with full conviction, but which he can nevertheless undertake to expound, since it is not in fact wholly impossible that they may contain truth. At all events, nothing opposed to the essence of religion is present in such doctrines. For if the clergyman thought he could find anything of this sort in them, he would not be able to carry out his official duties in good conscience, and would have to resign. Thus, the use which someone employed as a teacher makes of his reason in the presence of his congregation is purely private, since a congregation, however large it is, is never any more than a domestic gathering. In view of this, he is not, and cannot be free as a priest, since he is acting on a commission imposed from outside. Conversely, as a scholar, addressing the real public, i.e. the world at large, through his writings, the clergyman making public use of his reason, enjoys unlimited freedom to use his own reason, and to speak in his own person. For to maintain that the guardians of the people in spiritual matters should themselves be immature, is an absurdity which amounts to making absurdities permanent. But should not a society of clergymen, for example an ecclesiastical synod, or a venerable presbytery, as the Dutch call it, 
be entitled to commit itself by oath to a certain unalterable set of doctrines in order to secure for all time a constant guardianship over each of its members and through them over the people i reply that this is quite impossible a contract of this kind concluded with a view to preventing all further enlightenment of mankind for ever is absolutely null and void even if it is ratified by the supreme power by imperial diets and the most solemn peace treaties one age cannot enter into an alliance on oath to put the next age in a position where it would be impossible for it to extend and correct its knowledge particularly on such important matters or to make any progress whatsoever in enlightenment this would be a crime against human nature whose original destiny lies precisely in such progress later generations are thus perfectly entitled to dismiss these agreements as unauthorized and criminal to test whether any particular measure can be agreed upon as a law for a people we need only ask whether a people could well impose such a law upon itself this might well be possible for a specified short period as a means of introducing a certain order pending as it were a better solution this would also mean that each citizen particularly the clergyman would be given a free hand as a scholar to comment publicly i e in his writings on the inadequacies of current institutions meanwhile the newly established order would continue to exist until public insight into the nature of such matters had progressed and proved itself to the point where by general consent if not unanimously a proposal could be submitted to the crown this would seek to protect the congregations who had for instance agreed to alter their religious establishment in accordance with their own notions of what higher insight is but it would not try to obstruct those who wanted to let things remain as before but it is absolutely impermissible to agree even for a single lifetime to a permanent religious constitution which no one might publicly question for this would virtually nullify a phase in man's upward progress thus making it fruitless and even detrimental to subsequent generations a man may for his own person and even then for only a limited period postpone enlightening himself in matters he ought to know about but to renounce such enlightenment completely whether for his own person or even more so for later generations means violating and trampling under foot the sacred rights of mankind but something which a people may not even impose upon itself can still less be imposed upon it by a monarch for his legislative authority depends precisely upon his uniting the collective will of the people in his own so long as he sees to it that all true or imagined improvements are compatible with the civil order he can otherwise leave his subjects to do whatever they find necessary for their salvation which is none of his business but it is his business to stop anyone forcibly hindering others from working as best they can to define and promote their salvation it indeed detracts from his majesty if he interferes in these affairs by subjecting the writings in which his subjects attempt to clarify their religious ideas to governmental supervision this applies if he does so acting upon his own exalted opinions in which case he exposes himself to the reproach caesar non es supragrammaticos but much more so if he demeans his high authority so far as to support the spiritual despotism of a few tyrants within his state against the rest of his subjects if it is now asked whether we at present live in an enlightened age the answer is no but we do live in an age of enlightenment as things are at present we still have a long way to go before men as a whole can be in a position or can ever be put into a position of using their own understanding confidently and well in religious matters without outside guidance but we do have distinct indications that the way is now being cleared for them to work freely in this direction and that the obstacles to universal enlightenment to man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity are gradually becoming fewer in this respect our age is the age of enlightenment the century of frederick a prince who does not regard it as beneath him to say that he considers it his duty in religious matters not to prescribe anything to his people but to allow them complete freedom a prince who thus even declines to accept the presumptuous title of tolerant is himself enlightened he deserves to be praised by a grateful present and posterity as the man who first liberated mankind from immaturity 
as far as government is concerned, and who left all men free to use their own reason in all matters of conscience. Under his rule, ecclesiastical dignitaries, notwithstanding their official duties, may, in their capacity as scholars, freely and publicly submit to the judgment of the world their verdicts and opinions, even if these deviate here and there from orthodox doctrine. This applies even more to all others who are not restricted by any official duties. This spirit of freedom is also spreading abroad, even where it has to struggle with outward obstacles imposed by governments which misunderstand their own function. For such governments now witness a shining example of how freedom may exist without in the least jeopardizing public concord and the unity of the commonwealth. Men will, of their own accord, gradually work their way out of barbarism, so long as artificial measures are not deliberately adopted to keep them in it. I have portrayed matters of religion as the focal point of enlightenment, i.e. of man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. This is firstly because our rulers have no interest in assuming the role of guardians over their subjects so far as the arts and sciences are concerned, and secondly, because religious immaturity is the most pernicious and dishonorable variety of all. But the attitude of mind of a head of state, who favors freedom in the arts and sciences, extends even further, for he realizes that there is no danger even to his legislation, if he allows his subjects to make public use of their own reason, and to put before the public their thoughts on better ways of drawing up laws, even if this entails forthright criticism of the current legislation. We have before us a brilliant example of this kind, in which no monarch has yet surpassed the one to whom we now pay tribute. But only a ruler who is himself enlightened, and has no fear of phantoms, yet who likewise has at hand a well-disciplined and numerous army to guarantee public security, may say what no republic would dare to say. Argue as much as you like, and about whatever you like, but obey. This reveals to us a strange and unexpected pattern in human affairs, such as we shall always find if we consider them in the widest sense, in which nearly everything is paradoxical. A high degree of civil freedom seems advantageous to a people's intellectual freedom, yet it also sets up insuperable barriers to it. Conversely, a lesser degree of civil freedom gives intellectual freedom enough room to expand to its fullest extent. Thus, once the germ on which nature has lavished most care, man's inclination and vocation to think freely, has developed within this hard shell, it gradually reacts upon the mentality of the people, who thus gradually become increasingly able to act freely. Eventually, it even influences the principles of governments, which find that they can themselves profit by treating man, who is more than a machine, in a manner appropriate to his dignity. End of An Answer to the Question What is Enlightenment? by Immanuel Kant Deity and Design by Chapman Cohen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Deity and Design The Pioneer Press The one certain thing about the history of the human intellect is that it runs from ignorance to knowledge. Man begins knowing nothing of his own nature, or of the nature of the world in which he is living. He continues acquiring a little knowledge here and there, with his vision broadening and his understanding deepening as his knowledge increases. Had man commenced with but a very small fraction of the knowledge he now possesses, the present state of the human mind would be very different from what it is. But the method by which knowledge is acquired is of the slowest. It is by way of what is called trial and error. Blunders are made rapidly, to be corrected slowly. Some of the most primitive errors are not, on a general scale, corrected even today. Man begins by believing, on what appears to be sound evidence, that the earth is flat, only to discover later that it is a sphere. He believes the sky to be a solid something, and the heavenly bodies but a short distance away. 
His conclusions about himself are as fantastically wrong as those he makes about the world at large. He mistakes the nature of the diseases from which he suffers, and the causes of the things in which he delights. He is as ignorant of the nature of birth as he is of the cause of death. Thousands of generations pass before he takes the first faltering steps along the road of verifiable knowledge, and hundreds of thousands of generations have not sufficed to wipe out from the human intellect the influence of man's primitive blunders. Prominent among these primitive misunderstandings is the belief that man is surrounded by hosts of mysterious ghostly agencies that are afterwards given human form. These ghostly beings form the raw material from which gods of the various religions are made, and they flourish best where knowledge is least. Of this there can be no question. Atheism, the absence of belief in gods, is a comparatively late phenomenon in history. It is the belief in gods that begins by being universal. And even among civilized peoples, it is the least enlightened who are the most certain about the existence of the gods. The religious scientist or philosopher says, I believe. The ignorant believer says, I know. Now, it would indeed be strange if primitive man was right on the one thing concerning which exact knowledge is not to be gained, and wrong about all other things on which knowledge has either been, or bids fair to be, one. All civilized peoples reject the world theories that the savage first formulates. Is it credible that with regard to gods he was at once and unmistakably correct? It is useless saying that we do not accept the gods of the primitive world. In form, no. In essence, yes. The fact before us is that all ideas of gods can be traced to the earliest stages of human history. We have changed the names of the gods and their characteristics. We even worship them in a way that is often different from the primitive way. But there is an unbroken line of descent linking the gods of the most primitive peoples to those of modern man. We reject the world of the savage, but we still, in our churches, mosques, synagogues, and temples, perpetuate the theories he built upon that world. In this pamphlet I am not concerned with all the so-called evidences that are put forth to prove the existence of a god. I say so-called evidences, because they are not grounds upon which the belief in God rests. They are mere excuses why that belief should be retained. Ninety percent of believers in God would not understand these proofs. Roman Catholic propagandists lately, as one of the advertisements of the Church, have been booming the arguments in favor of a God, as stated by Thomas Aquinas. But they usually preface their exposition, which is very often questionable, by the warning that the subject is difficult to understand. In the case of Roman Catholics, I think we might well raise the percentage of those who do not understand the arguments to 95%. In any case, these metaphysical, mathematical, and philosophic arguments do not furnish the grounds upon which anyone believes in God. They are, as I have just said, nothing more than excuses framed for the purpose of hanging on to it. The belief in God is here because it is part of our social inheritance. We are born into an environment in which each newcomer finds the belief in God established, backed up by powerful institutions, with an army of trained advocates committed to its defense and to the destruction of everything that tends to weaken the belief and behind all are the countless generations during which the belief in God lived on man's ignorance and fear. In spite of the alleged proofs of the existence of God, belief in him or it does not grow in strength or certainty. These proofs do not prevent the number of avowed disbelievers increasing to such an extent that, whereas after Christians proclaiming for several generations that atheism, real atheism, does not exist, the defenders of godism are now shrieking against the growing numbers of atheists, and there is a call to the religious world to enter upon a crusade against atheism. The stage in which heresy meant little more than all exchange of one god for another has passed. It has become a case of acceptance or rejection of the idea of God, and the growth is with those who reject. This is not the way in which proofs, real proofs, operate. A theory may have to battle long for general or growing acceptance, but it grows provided it can produce evidence in its support. A hypothesis is stated, challenged, discussed, and finally rejected or accepted. On the question of the hypothesis of God, the longer it is discussed, the less it is believed. No wonder that the ideal attitude of the completely religious should be on the knee, with eyes closed and mouths full of nothing but petitions and grossly fulsome praise. That is also the reason why every religious organization in the world is so keen upon capturing the child. The cry is, 
if we lose the child, we lose everything, which is another way of saying that, if we cannot implant a belief in God before the child is old enough to understand something of what it is being told, the belief may have to be given up altogether. Keep the idea of God away from the child, and it will grow up an atheist. If there is a God, the evidence for his existence must be found in this world. We cannot start with another world and work back to this one. That is why the argument from design and nature is really fundamental to the belief in a deity. It is implied in every argument in favor of theism, although nowadays, in its simplest and most honest form, it is not so popular as it was. But to ordinary men and women it is still the decisive piece of evidence in favor of the existence of a god. And when ordinary men and women cease to believe in God, the class of religious philosophers who spend their time seeing by what subtleties of thought and tricks of language they can make the belief in a deity appear intellectually respectable, will cease to function. But let it be observed that we are concerned with the existence of God only. We are not concerned with whether he is good or bad, whether his alleged designs are commendable or not. One often finds people saying they cannot believe there is a God because the works of nature are not cast in a benevolent mold. That has nothing to do with the essential issue, and proves only that theists cannot claim a monopoly of defective logic. We are concerned with whether nature, in whole or in part, shows any evidence of design. My case is, first, the argument is fallacious in its structure, second, it assumes all that it sets out to prove, and begs the whole question by the language employed, and third, the case against design in nature is not merely that the evidence is inadequate, but that the evidence produced is completely irrelevant. If the same kind of evidence were produced in a court of law, there is not a judge in the country who would not dismiss it as having nothing whatever to do with the question at issue. I do not say that the argument from design, as stated, fails to convince. I say that it is impossible to produce any kind of evidence that could persuade an impartial mind to believe in it. The argument from design professes to be one from analogy. John Stuart Mill, himself without a belief in God, thought the argument to be of a genuinely scientific character. The present dean of St. Paul's, Dr. Matthews, says that the argument from design employs ideas which everyone possesses and thinks he understands, and moreover it seems evident to the simplest intelligence that if God exists he must be doing something, and therefore must be pursuing some ends and carrying out some purpose. The Purpose of God, page 13. And Immanuel Kant said that the argument from design was the oldest, the clearest, and the best adapted to ordinary human reason. But as Kant proceeded to smash the argument into smithereens, it is evident that he had not very flattering an opinion of the quality of the reason displayed by the ordinary man. But what is professedly an argument from analogy turns out to offer no analogy at all. A popular non-conformist preacher, Dr. Leslie Weatherhead, whose book, Why Do Men Suffer, might be taken as a fine textbook of religious foolishness, repeats the old argument that if we were to find a number of letters so arranged that they formed words, we should infer design in the arrangement. Agreed, but that is obviously because we know that letters and words, and the arrangement of words, are due to the design of man. The argument here is from experience. We infer that a certain conjunction of signs are designed, because we know beforehand that such things are designed. But in the case of nature, we have no such experience on which to build. We do not know that natural objects are made. We know of no one who makes natural objects. More, the very division of objects into natural and artificial is all admission that natural objects are not, prima facie, products of design at all. To constitute an analogy, we need to have the same knowledge that natural objects are manufactured as we have that man's works are manufactured. Design is not found in nature, it is assumed. As Kant says, reason admires a wonder created by itself. The theist cannot move a step in his endeavor to prove design in nature without being guilty of the plainest of logical blunders. It is illustrated in the very language employed. Thus, Dr. Matthew cites a Roman Catholic priest as saying, The adaptation of means to ends is an evident sign of intelligent cause. Now, nature offers on every side instances of adaptations of means to ends, hence it follows that nature is the work of an intelligent cause. Dr. Matthews does not like this way of putting the case, but his own reasoning shows that he is objecting more to the argument being stated plainly and concisely, rather than to its substance. Nowadays it is dangerous to make one's religious reasoning so plain that everyone can understand the language used. 
Consider. Nature, we are told, shows endless adaptations of means to ends. But nature shows nothing of the kind, or at least that is the point to be proved, and it must not be taken for granted. If nature is full of adaptation of means to ends, then there is nothing further about which to dispute. For adaptation means the conscious adjustment of things or conditions to a desired consummation. To adapt a thing is to make it fit to do this or that, to serve this or that purpose. We adapt our conduct to the occasion, our language to the person we are addressing, planks of wood to the purpose we have in mind, and so forth. So, of course, if nature displays an adaptation of means to ends, then the case for an adapter is established. But nature shows nothing of the kind. What nature provides is processes and results, that and nothing more. The structure of an animal in its relation to its environment, the outcome of a chemical combination, the falling of rain, the elevation of a mountain, these things, with all other natural phenomena, do not show an adaptation of means to ends. They show simply a process and its result. Nature exhibits the universal phenomenon of causation, and that is all. Processes and results looked like adaptations of means to ends, so long as the movements of nature were believed to be the expression of the will of the gods. But when natural phenomena are regarded as the inevitable product of the properties of existence, such terms as means and ends are at best misleading, and in actual practice often deliberately dishonest. The situation was well expressed by the late W. H. Malick. Quote, when we consider the movement of the starry heavens today, instead of feeling it to be wonderful that these are absolutely regular, we should feel it to be wonderful if they were ever anything else. We realize that the stars are not bodies which, unless they are made to move uniformly, would be floating in space motionless, or moving across it in random courses. We realize that they are bodies which, unless they moved uniformly, would not be bodies at all, and would exist neither in movement nor in rest. We realize that order, instead of being the marvel of the universe, is the indispensable condition of its existence, that it is a physical platitude, not a divine paradox. Unquote. But there are still many who continue to marvel at the wisdom of God in so planning the universe that big rivers run by great towns, and that death comes at the end of life instead of in the middle of it. Divest the pleas of such men as the Reverend Dr. Matthews of their semi-philosophic jargon, reduce his illustrations to homely similes, and he is marveling at the wisdom of God who so planned things that the two extremities of a piece of wood should come at the ends instead of in the middle. The trick is, after all, obvious. The theist takes terms that can apply to sentient life alone and applies them to the universe at large. He talks about means, that is, the deliberate planning to achieve certain ends, and then says that as there are means, there must be ends. Having unperceived placed the rabbit in the hat, he is able to bring it forth to the admiration of his audience. The so-called adaptation of means to ends, properly the relation of processes to results, is not something that can be picked out from phenomena as a whole as an illustration of divine wisdom. It is an expression of a universal truism. The product implies the process because it is the sum of the power of the factors expressed by it, it is a physical, a chemical, a biological platitude. I have hitherto followed the lines marked out by the theist in his attempt to prove that there exists a mind behind natural phenomena, and that the universe as we have it is, at least generally, an evidence of a plan designed by this mind. I have also pointed out that the only datum for such a conclusion is the universe we know. We must take that as a starting point. We can get neither behind it nor beyond it. We cannot start with God and deduce the universe from his existence. We must start with the world as we know it, and deduce God from the world. And we can only do this by likening the universe as a product that has come into existence, as part of the design of God, much as a table or wireless set comes into existence as part of the planning of a human mind. But the conditions for doing this do not exist, and it is remarkable that, in many cases, critics of the design argument should so often have criticized it as though it were inconclusive. But the true line of criticism, the criticism that is absolutely fatal to the design argument, is that there is no logical possibility of deducing design from a study of natural phenomena, and there is no other direction in which we can look for proof. The theist has never yet managed to produce a case for design which, upon examination, might not rightly be dismissed as irrelevant to the point at issue. 
In what way can we set about proving that a thing is a product of design? We cannot do this by showing that a process ends in a result, because every process ends in a result, and in every case the result is an expression of the process. If I throw a brick, it matters not whether the brick hits a man on the head and kills him, or if it breaks a window, or merely falls to the ground without hurting anyone or anything. In each case, the distance the brick travels, the force of the impact on the head, the window, or on the ground, remains the same, and not the most exact knowledge of these factors would enable anyone to say whether the result following the throwing of the brick was designed or not. Shakespeare is credited with having written a play called King Lear, but whether Shakespeare sat down with the deliberate intention of writing Lear, or whether the astral body of Bacon, or someone else, took possession of the body of Shakespeare during the writing of Lear, makes no difference whatever to the result. Again, an attendant on a sick man is handling a number of bottles, some of which contain medicine, others a deadly poison. Instead of giving his patient the medicine, the poison is administered, and the patient dies. An inquest is held, and whether the poison was given deliberately, or, as we say, by accident, there is the same sequence of cause and effect, of process and result. So one might multiply the illustrations indefinitely. No one observing the sequences could possibly say whether any of these unmistakable results were designed or not. One cannot, in any of these cases, logically infer design. The material for such a decision is not present. Yet in each of these cases named, we could prove design by producing evidence of intention. If, when throwing the brick, I intended to kill the man, I am guilty of murder. If I intend to poison, I am also guilty of murder. If there existed in the mind of Shakespeare a conception of the plan of Lear, before writing, and if the plan carried out that intention, then the play was designed. In every case, the essential fact, without a knowledge of which it is impossible logically to assume design, is a knowledge of intention. We must know what was intended, and we must then compare the result with the intention, and note the measure of agreement that exists between the two. It is not enough to say that one man threw the brick, and that if it had not been thrown, the other would not have been killed. It is not enough to say that if the poison had not been given, the patient would not have died. And it certainly is not enough to argue that the course of events can be traced from the time the brick left the hands of the first man until it struck the second one. That, as I have said, remains true in any case. The law is insistent that in such cases the intent must be established, and in this matter the law acts with scientific and philosophic wisdom. Now, in all the cases mentioned, and they are, of course, merely samples from bulk, we look for design because we know that men do write plays, men do poison other men, and men do throw things at each other with the purpose of inflicting bodily injury. We are using what is known as a means of tackling, for the time being, the unknown. But our knowledge of world-builders, or universe designers, is not on all fours with the cases named. We know nothing whatever about them, and therefore cannot reason from what is known to what is unknown in the hopes of including the unknown in the category of the known. Second, assuming there to be a god, we have no means of knowing what his intentions were when he made the world, assuming that also. We cannot know what his intention was, and contrast that intention with the result. On the known facts, assuming God to exist, we have no means of deciding whether the world we have is part of his design or not. He might have set about creating and intended something different. You cannot, in short, start with a physical, with a natural fact, and reach intention. Yet, if we are to prove purpose, we must begin with intention, and, having a knowledge of that, see how far the product agrees with the design. It is the marriage of a psychical fact with a physical one that alone can demonstrate intention or design. Mere agreement of the end with the means proves nothing at all. The end is the means brought to fruition. The fundamental objection to the argument from design is that it is completely irrelevant. The belief in God is not, therefore, based on the perception of design in nature. Belief in design in nature is based upon the belief in God. Things are as they are whether there is a God or not. Logically, to believe in design, one must start with God. He, or it, is not a conclusion, but a datum. You may begin by assuming a creator, and then say he did this or that, but you cannot logically say that because certain things exist, therefore there is a God who made them. God is an assumption, not a conclusion. 
and it is assumption that explains nothing. If I may quote from my book, Theism or Atheism, To warrant a logical belief in design and nature, three things are essential. First, one must assume that God exists. Second, one must take it for granted that one has a knowledge of the intention in the mind of the deity before the alleged design is brought into existence. Finally, one must be able to compare the result with the intention and demonstrate their agreement. But the impossibility of knowing the first two is apparent, and without the first two the third is of no value whatever. For we have no means of reaching the first except through the third, and until we get to the first we cannot make use of the third. We are thus in a hopeless impasse. No examination of nature can lead back to God because we lack the necessary starting point. All the volumes that have been written, and all the sermons that have been preached, depicting the wisdom of organic structures, are so much waste of time and breath. They prove nothing and can prove nothing. They assume at the beginning all they require at the end. Their God is not something reached by way of inference, it is something assumed at the very outset." Unquote. Finally, if there be a designing mind behind or in nature, then we have a right to expect unity. The products of the design should, so to speak, dovetail into each other. A plan implies this. A gun so designed as to kill the one who fired it, and the one at whom it was aimed, would be evidence only of the action of a lunatic or a criminal. When we say we find evidence of a design, we at least imply the presence of an element of unity. What do we find? Taking the animal world as a whole, what strikes the observer, even the religious observer, is the fact of the antagonisms existing in nature. These are so obvious that religious opinion invented a devil in order to account for them. And one of the arguments used by religious people to justify the belief in a future life is that God has created another world in which the injustices and blunders of this life may be corrected. For his case, the theist requires cooperative action in nature. That does exist among the social animals, but only as regards the individuals within the group, and even there in a very imperfect form. But taking animal life, I do not know of any instance where it can truthfully be said that different species of animals are designed so as to help each other. It is probable that some exceptions to this might be found in the relations between insects and flowers, but the animal world certainly provides none. The carnivores not only live on the herbivores, but they live, when and where they can, on each other. And God, if we may use theistic language, prepares for this by, on the one hand, so equipping the one that it may often seize its prey, and the other that it may often escape. And when we speak of a creation that brings an animal into greater harmony with its environment, it must not be forgotten that the greater harmony, the perfection of the adaptation, at which the theist is lost in admiration, is often the condition of the destruction of other animals. If each were equally well adapted, one of the competing species would die out. If, therefore, we are to look for design in nature, we can, at most, see only the manifestations of a mind that takes a delight in destroying on the one hand what has been built upon the other. There is also the myriads of parasites, as clear evidence of design as anything, that live by the infection and the destruction of forms of life higher than their own. Of the number of animals born, only a very small proportion can ever hope to reach maturity. If we reckon the number of spermatozoa that are created, then the number of those that live are ridiculously small. The number would be one in millions. Is there any difference when we come to man? With profound egotism, the theist argues that the process of evolution is justified because it has produced him. But with both structure and feeling, there is the same suicidal fact before us. Of the human structure, it would seem that, for every step man has taken away from mere animal nature, God has laid a trap and provided a penalty. If man will walk upright, then he must be prepared for a greater liability to hernia. If he will live in cities, he must pay the price in a greater liability to tuberculosis. If he will leave his animal brothers behind him, he must bear reminders of them, in the shape of a useless coating of hair that helps to contract various diseases, a rudimentary second stomach that provides the occasion for appendicitis, rudimentary wisdom teeth that give a chance for mental disease. It has been calculated that man carries about with him over one hundred rudimentary structures, each absorbing energy and giving nothing in return. 
So one might go on. Nature, taken from the point of view most favorable to the theist, gives us no picture of unified design. Put aside the impossibility of providing a logical case for the inferring of design in nature, it remains that the only conception we can have of a designer is, as W. H. Malick, a staunch Roman Catholic, has said, that of a scatterbrained, semi-powerful, semi-impotent monster, kicking his heels in the sky, not perhaps bent on mischief, but indifferent to the fact that he is causing it. End of Deity and Design by Chapman Cohen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness Escape by Arthur Christopher Benson All the best stories in the world are but one story in reality, the story of an escape. It is the only thing which interests us all and at all times. How to escape? The stories of Joseph, of Odysseus, of the prodigal son, of the pilgrim's progress, of the ugly duckling, of Sintram, to name only a few out of a great number, they are all stories of escapes. It is the same with all love stories. The course of true love never can run smooth, says the old proverb, and love stories are but tales of a man or a woman's escape from the desert of loveliness into the citadel of love. Even tragedies like those of Oedipus and Hamlet have the same thought in the background. In the tale of Oedipus, the old blind king, in his tattered robe, who had committed in ignorance such nameless crimes, leaves his two daughters and the attendants standing below the old pear tree and the marble tomb by the sacred fountain. He says the last faint words of love till the voice of the god comes thrilling upon the air. Oedipus, why delayest thou? Then he walks away at once, in silence, leaning on the arm of Theseus, and when at last the watchers dare to look, they see Theseus afar off, alone, screening his eyes with his hand, as if some sight too dreadful for mortal eyes had passed before him. But Oedipus is gone, and not with lamentation, but in hope and wonder. Even when Hamlet dies, and the peal of ordnance is shot off, it is to congratulate him upon his escape from unbearable woe and that is the same in life. If our eye falls on the sad stories of men and women who have died by their own hand, how seldom do they speak in the scrawled messages they leave behind them, as though they were going to silence and nothingness. It is just the other way. The unhappy fathers and mothers, who, maddened by disaster, kill their children, are hoping to escape with those they love best, out of miseries they cannot bear. They mean to fly together, as Lot fled with his daughters from the city of the plain. The man who slays himself is not the man who hates life. He only hates the sorrow and the shame which make unbearable that life which he loves only too well. He is trying to migrate to other conditions. He desires to live, but he cannot live so. It is the imagination of man that makes him seek death. Only the animal endures, but man hurries away in the hope of finding something better. It is, however, strange to reflect how weak man's imagination is when it comes to deal with what is beyond him, how little able he is to devise anything that he desires to do when he has escaped from life. The unsubstantial heaven of a Buddhist, with its unthinkable nirvana, is merely the depriving life of all its attributes. The dull sensuality of the Mohammedan paradise, with its ugly multiplication of gross delights, the tedious outcries of the saints in light which make the medieval scheme of heaven into one protracted canticle, these are all deeply unattractive, and have no power at all over the vigorous spirit. Even the vision of Socrates, the hope of unrestricted converse with great minds, is a very unsatisfying thought, because it yields so little material to work upon. The fact, of course, is that it is just the variety of experience which makes life interesting, toil and rest, pain and relief, hope and satisfaction, danger and security, and if we once remove the idea of vicissitude from life, it all becomes an indolent and uninspiring affair. It is the process of change which is delightful, the finding out what we can do and what we cannot, going from ignorance to knowledge, from clumsiness to skill. Even our relations with those whom we love are all bound up with the discoveries we make about them and the degree in which we can help them and affect them. 
what the mind instinctively dislikes is stationariness and an existence in which there was nothing to escape from nothing more to hope for to learn to desire would be frankly unendurable the reason why we dread death is because it seems to be a suspension of all our familiar activities it would be terrible to have nothing but memory to depend upon the only use of memory is that it distracts us a little from present conditions if they are dull and it is only too true that the recollection and sorrow of happy things is torture of the worst kind once when Tennyson was suffering from a dangerous illness, his friend Jowett wrote to Lady Tennyson to suggest that the poet might find comfort in thinking of all the good he had done. But that is not the kind of comfort that a sufferer desires. We may envy a good man his retrospective activity, but we cannot really suppose that to meditate complacently upon what one has been enabled to do is the final thought that a good man is likely to indulge he is far more likely to torment himself over all that he might have done. It is true, I think, that old and tired people pass into a quiet serenity, but it is the serenity of the old dog who sleeps in the sun, wags his tail if he is invited to bestir himself, but does not leave his place, and if one reaches that condition, it is but a dumb gratitude at the thought that nothing more is expected of the worn-out frame and fatigued mind. But no one, I should imagine, really hopes to step into immortality so tired and worn out that the highest hope that he can frame is that he will be let alone forever. We must not trust the drowsiness of the outworn spirit to frame the real hopes of humanity. If we believe that the next experience ahead of us is like that of the mariners, in the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon, then we acquiesce in a dreamless sort of sleep as the best hope of man. No, we must rather trust the desires of the spirit at its healthiest and most vigorous, and these are all knit up with the adventure of escape, as I have said. There is something hostile on our track. The copse that closes in upon the road is thick with spears. Presences that do not wish us well move darkly in the wood and keep pace with us. And the only explanation we can give is that we need to be spurred on by fear if we are not drawn forward by desire or hope. We have to keep moving, and if we will not run to the goal, we must at least flee, with backward glances at something which threatens us. There is an old and strange eastern allegory of a man wandering in the desert. He draws near to a grove of trees when he suddenly becomes aware that there is a lion on his track, hurrying and bounding along on the scent of his steps. The man flees for safety into the grove. He sees there a roughly built water tank of stone excavated in the ground and built up of masonry much fringed with plants. He climbs swiftly down to where he sees a ledge close on the water. As he does this, he sees that in the water lies a great lizard with open jaws, watching him with wicked eyes. He stops short, and he can just support himself among the stones by holding on to the branches of a plant which grows from a ledge above him. While he thus holds on, with death behind him and before, he feels the branches quivering and sees above, out of reach, two mice, one black and one white, which are nibbling at the stems he holds, and will soon sever them. He waits despairingly, and while he does so, he sees that there are drops of honey on the leaves which he holds. He puts his lips to them, licks them off, and finds them very sweet. The mice stand, no doubt, for night and day, and the honey is the sweetness of life, which it is possible to taste and relish even when death is before and behind, and it is true that the utter precariousness of life does not, as a matter of fact, distract us from the pleasure of it, even though the strands to which we hold are slowly parting. It is all, then, an adventure and an escape, but even in the worst insecurity we may often be surprised to find that it is somehow sweet. It is not in the least a question of the apparent and outward adventurousness of one's life. Foolish people sometimes write and think as though one could not have had adventures unless one has hung about at bar-room doors and in billiard saloons, worked one's passage before the mast in a sailing ship, dug for gold among the mountains, explored savage lands, shot strange animals, fared hardly among deep-drinking and loud-swearing men. It is possible, of course, to have adventures of this kind, and, indeed, I had a near relative whose life was fuller of vicissitudes than any life I have ever known. He was a sailor, a clerk, a policeman, a soldier, a clergyman, a farmer, a verger, but the mere unsettledness of it suited him. 
He was an easy comrade, brave, reckless, restless. He did not mind roughness, and the one thing he could not do was to settle down to anything regular and quiet. He did not dislike life at all, even when he stood half-naked, as he once told me he did, on a board slung from the side of a ship, and dipped up pails of water to swab it, the water freezing as he flung it on the timbers. But with all this variety of life, he did not learn anything particular from it all. He was much the same always, good-natured, talkative, childishly absorbed, not looking backward or forward, and fondest of telling stories with sailors in an inn. He learned to be content in most companies, and to fare roughly, but he gained neither wisdom nor humor, and he was not either happy or independent, though he despised with all his heart the stay-at-home, stick-in-the-mud life. But we are not all made like this, and it is only possible for a few people to live so by the fact that most people prefer to stay at home and do the work of the world. My cousin was not a worker, and indeed did not work except under compulsion and in order to live, but such people seem to belong to an older order and are more like children playing about, and at leisure to play because others work to feed and clothe them. The world would be a wretched and miserable place if all tried to live life on those lines. It would be impossible to me to live so, though I dare say I should be a better man if I had had a little more hardship of that kind, but I have worked hard in my own way, and though I have had few hairbreadth escapes, yet I have had sharp troubles and slow anxieties. I have been like the man in the story, between the lion and the lizard, for many months together, and I have had more to bear, by temperament and fortune, than my roving cousin ever had to endure, so that because a life seems both sheltered and prosperous, it need not therefore have been without its adventures and escapes and its haunting fears. The more one examines into life and the motives of it, the more does one perceive that the imagination, concerning itself with hopes of escape from any condition which hamper and confine us, is the dynamic force that is transmuting the world. The child is forever planning what it will do when it is older, and dreams of an irresponsible choice of food and an unrestrained use of money. The girl schemes to escape from the constraints of home by independence or marriage. The professional man plans to make a fortune and retire. The mother dreams ambitious dreams for her children. The politician craves for power. The writer hopes to gain the ear of the world. These are only a few casual instances of the desire that is always at work within us, projecting us into a larger and freer future out of the limited and restricted present. That is the real current of the world, and though there are sedate people who are contented with life as they see it, yet in most minds there is a fluttering of little tremulous hopes forecasting ease and freedom, and there are also many tired and dispirited people who are not content with life as they have it, but acquiesce in its dreariness, yet all who have any part in the world's development are full of schemes for themselves and others by which the clogging and detaining elements are somehow to be improved away. Sensitive people want to find life more harmonious and beautiful. Healthy people desire a more continuous sort of holiday than they can attain. Religious people long for a secret ecstasy of peace. There is, in fact, a constant desire at work to realize perfection. And yet, despite it all, there is a vast preponderance of evidence which shows us that the attainment of our little dreams is not a thing to be desired, and that satisfied desire is the least contented of moods. If we realize our program, if we succeed, marry the woman we love, make a fortune, win leisure, gain power, a whole host of further desires instantly come in sight. I once congratulated a statesman on a triumphant speech. Yes, he said, I do not deny that it is a pleasure to have had for once the exact effect that one intended to have, but the shadow of it is the fear that having once reached that standard one may not be able to keep it up. The awful penalty of success is the haunting dread of subsequent failure, and even sadder still is the fact that, in striving eagerly to attain an end, we are apt to lose the sense of the purpose which inspired us. This is more drearily true of the pursuit of money than of anything else. I could name several friends of my own who started in business with the perfectly definite and avowed intention of making a competence in order that they might live as they desired to live that they might travel, read, write, enjoy a secure leisure. But when they had done exactly what they meant to do, the desires were all atrophied. They could not give up their work. They felt it would be safer to have a larger margin. They feared that they might be bored. They had made friends and did not wish to sever the connection. They must provide a little more for their families. 
the whole program had insensibly altered even so they were still planning to escape from something from some boredom or anxiety or dread and yet it seems very difficult for any person to realize what is the philosophical conclusion namely that the work of each of us matters very little to the world but that it matters very much to ourselves that we should have some work to do we seem to be a very feeble-minded race in this respect that we require to be constantly bribed and tempted by illusions i have known men of force and vigor both in youth and middle life who had a strong sense of the value and significance of their work as age came upon them the value of their work gradually disappeared they were deferred to consulted outwardly reverenced and perhaps all the more scrupulously and compassionately in order that they might not guess the lamentable fact that their work was done and that the forces and influences were in younger hands but the men themselves never lost the sense of their importance i knew an octogenarian clergyman who declared once in my presence that it was ridiculous to say that old men lost their faculty of dealing with affairs why he said it is only quite in the last few years that i feel i have really mastered my work it takes me far less time than it used to do it is just promptly and methodically executed the old man obviously did not know that his impression that his work consumed less time was only too correct because it was as a matter of fact almost wholly performed by his colleagues and nothing was referred to him except purely formal business it seems rather pitiful that we should not be able to face the truth and that we cannot be content with discerning the principle of it all which is that our work is given to us to do not for its intrinsic value but because it is good for us to do it the secret government of the world seems indeed to be penetrated by a good-natured irony it is as if the power controlling us saw that like children we must be tenderly wooed into doing things which we should otherwise neglect by a sense of high importance as a kindly father who is doing accounts keeps his children quiet by letting one hold the blotting paper and another the ink so that they believe that they are helping when they are merely being kept from hindering and this strange sense of escape which drives us into activity and energy seems given us not that we may realize our aims which turn out hollow and vapid enough when they are realized but that we may drink deep of experience for the sake of its beneficent effect upon us the failure of almost all utopias and ideal states designed and planned by writers and artists lies in the absence of all power to suggest how the happy folk who have conquered the ills and difficulties of life are to employ themselves reasonably and eagerly when there is nothing left to improve william morris indeed in his news from nowhere confessed through the mouth of one of his characters that there would be hardly enough pleasant work like haymaking and bridge building and carpentering and paving left to go around and the picture of life which he draws with its total lack of privacy the shops where you may ask for anything that you want without having to pay the guest-houses with their straw-colored wine and quaint carafes the rich stews served in gray earthenware dishes streaked with blue the dancing the caressing the singular absence of all elderly women strikes on the mind with a quite peculiar sense of boredom and vacuity because morris seems to have eliminated so many sources of human interest and to have conformed every one to a type which is refreshing enough as a contrast but very tiresome in the mass it will not be enough to have got rid of the combative and sordid and vulgar elements of the world unless a very active spirit of some kind has taken its place morris himself intended that art should supply the missing force but art is not a sociable thing it is apt to be a lonely affair and few artists have either leisure or inclination to admire one another's work still more dreary was the dream of the philosopher j s mill who was asked upon one occasion what would be left for men to do when they had been perfected on the lines which he desired he replied after a long and painful hesitation that they might find satisfaction in reading the poems of wordsworth but wordsworth's poems are useful in the fact that they supply a refreshing contrast to the normal thought of the world and nothing but the fact that many took a different view of life was potent enough to produce them so for the present at all events we must be content to feel that our imagination provides us with a motive rather than with a goal and though it is very important that we should strive with all our might to eliminate the baser elements of life yet we must be brave and wise enough to confess how much of our best happiness is born of the fact that we have these elements to contend with 
Edward Fitzgerald once said that a fault of modern writing was that it tried to compress too many good things into a page, and aimed too much at omitting the homelier interspaces. We must not try to make our lives into a perpetual feast, at least we must try to do so, but it must be by conquest rather than by inglorious flight. We must face the fact that the stuff of life is both homely and indeed amiss, and realize, if we can, that our happiness is bound up with energetically trying to escape from conditions which we cannot avoid. When we are young and fiery-hearted, we think that a tame counsel. But, like all great truths, it dawns on us slowly. Not until we begin to ascend the hill do we grasp how huge, how complicated, how intricate the plain, with all its fields, woods, hamlets, and streams is. We are happy men and women if in middle age we even faintly grasp that the actual truth about life is vastly larger and finer than any impatient youthful fancies about it are, though it is good to have indulged our splendid fancies in youth, if only for the delight of learning how much more magnificent is the real design. In the pilgrim's progress at the very outset of the journey, evangelist asks Christian why he is standing still. He replies, because I know not whither to go. Evangelist, with a certain grimness of humor, thereupon hands him a parchment roll. One supposes that it will be a map or a paper of directions, but all that it has written in it is, Fly from the wrath to come. Well, it is no longer that of which we are afraid, a rain of fire and brimstone, storm and tempest. The power behind the world has better gifts than these, but we still have to fly, where we can and as fast as we can, and when we have traversed the dim leagues and have seen things wonderful at every turn, and have passed through the bitter flood, we shall find, at least this is my hope, no guarded city of God from which we shall go no more out, but another road passing into wider fields and dimmer uplands, and to things more and more wonderful and strange and unknown. End of Escape by Arthur Christopher Benson Recorded by Brian Ness The Future of Astronomy by Edward Pickering This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes, Cambridge, Massachusetts the Future of Astronomy by Professor Edward C. Pickering, Harvard College Observatory Reprinted from the Popular Science Monthly, August 1909 Commencement Address at K School of Applied Science, Cleveland, May 27, 1909 It is claimed by astronomers that their science is not only the oldest, but that it is the most highly developed of the sciences. Indeed, it should be so, since no other science has ever received such support from royalty, from the state, and from the private individual. However this may be, there is no doubt that in recent years astronomers have had granted to them greater opportunities for carrying on large pieces of work than have been entrusted to men in any other department of pure science. One might expect that the practical results of a science like physics would appeal to the man who has made a vast fortune through some of its applications. The telephone, the electric transmission of power, wireless telegraphy, and the submarine cable are instances of immense financial returns derived from the most abstruse principles of physics. Yet there are scarcely any physical laboratories devoted to research, or endowed with independent funds for this object, except those supported by the government. The endowment of astronomical observatories devoted to research, and not including that given for teaching, is estimated to amount to half a million dollars annually. Several of the larger observatories have an annual income of fifty thousand dollars. I once asked the wisest man I know what was the reason for this difference. He said that it was probably because astronomy appealed to the imagination. A practical man, who has spent all his life in his counting-room or mill, is sometimes deeply impressed with the vast distances and grandeur of the problems of astronomy, and the very remoteness and difficulty of studying the stars attract him. My object in calling your attention to this matter is the hope that what I have to say of the organization of astronomy may prove of use to those interested in other branches of science, and that it may lead to placing them on the footing they should hold. My arguments apply with almost equal force to physics, 
to chemistry, and in fact to almost every branch of physical or natural science in which knowledge may be advanced by observation or experiment. The practical value of astronomy in the past is easily established. Without it, international commerce on a large scale would have been impossible. Without the aid of astronomy, accurate boundaries of large tracts of land could not have been defined, and standard time would have been impossible. The work of the early astronomers was eminently practical, and appealed at once to everyone. This work has now been finished. We can compute the positions of the stars for years, almost for centuries, with all the accuracy needed for navigation, for determining time, or for approximate boundaries of countries. The investigations now in progress at the greatest observatories have little, if any, value in dollars and cents. They appeal, however, to the far higher sense, the desire of the intellectual human being to determine the laws of nature, the construction of the material universe, and the properties of the heavenly bodies, of which those known to exist far outnumber those that can be seen. Three great advances have been made in astronomy. First, the invention of the telescope, with which we commonly associate the name of Galileo, from the wonderful results he obtained with it. At that time there was practically no science in America, and for more than two centuries we failed to add materially to this invention. Half a century ago, the genius of the members of one family, Alvin Clark, and his two sons, placed America in the front rank not only in the construction, but in the possession, of the largest and most perfect telescopes ever made. It is not easy to secure the world's record in any subject. The Clarks constructed successively the 18-inch lens for Chicago, the 26-inch for Washington, the 30-inch for Polkawa, the 36-inch for Lick, and the 40-inch for Yerkes. Each in turn was the largest yet made, and each time the Clarks were called upon to surpass the world's record, which they themselves had already established. Have we at length reached the limit in size? If we include reflectors, no, since we have mirrors of 60 inches aperture at Mount Wilson and Cambridge, and a still larger one of 100 inches has been undertaken. It is more than doubtful, however, whether a further increase in size is a great advantage. Much more depends on other conditions, especially those of climate, the kind of work to be done, and, more than all, the man behind the gun. The case is not unlike that of a battleship. Would a ship a thousand feet long always sink one of five hundred feet? It seems as if we had nearly reached the limit of size of telescopes, and as if we must hope for the next improvement in some other direction. The second great advance in astronomy originated in America, and was in an entirely different direction, the application of photography to the study of the stars. The first photographic image of a star was obtained in 1850 by George P. Bond, with the assistance of Mr. J. A. Whipple, at the Harvard College Observatory. A daguerreotype plate was placed at the focus of the 15-inch equatorial, at that time one of the two largest refracting telescopes in the world. An image of Alpha Lyrae was thus obtained, and for this Mr. Bond received a gold medal at the first international exhibition, that at the Crystal Palace in London in 1851. In 1857, Mr. Bond, then Professor Bond, director of the Harvard Observatory, again took up the matter with collodion wet plates, and in three masterly papers showed the advantages of photography in many ways. The lack of sensitiveness of the wet plate was perhaps the only reason why its use progressed but slowly. Quarter of a century later, with the introduction of the dry plate and the gelatine film, a new start was made. These photographic plates were very sensitive were easily handled, and indefinitely long exposures could be made with them. As a result, photography has superseded visual observations in many departments of astronomy, and is now carrying them far beyond the limits that would have been deemed possible a few years ago. The third great advance in astronomy is in photographing the spectra of the stars. The first photograph showing the lines in a stellar spectrum was obtained by Dr. Henry Draper of New York in 1872. Sir William Huggins, in 1863, had obtained an image of the spectrum of Sirius on a photographic plate, but no lines were visible in it. In 1876 he again took up the subject, and, by an early publication, preceded Dr. Draper. When we consider the attention the photography of stellar spectra is receiving at the present time, 
in nearly all the great observatories in the world, it may well be regarded as the third great advance in astronomy. What will be the fourth advance, and how will it be brought about? To answer this question we must consider the various ways in which astronomy, and for that matter any other science, may be advanced. First, by educating astronomers. There are many observatories where excellent instruction in astronomy is given, either to the general student or to the one who wishes to make it his profession. At almost any active observatory, a student would be received as a volunteer assistant. Unfortunately, few young men can afford to accept an unpaid position, and the establishment of a number of fellowships, each offering a small salary sufficient to support the student, would enable him to acquire the necessary knowledge to fill a permanent position. The number of these scholarships should not be large, lest more students should undertake the work than would be required to fill the permanent paying positions in astronomy as they become vacant. In Europe, a favorite method of aiding science is to offer a prize for the best memoir on a specified subject. On theoretical grounds, this is extremely objectionable. Since the papers presented are anonymous and confidential, no one but the judges know how great is the effort wasted in duplication. The larger the prize, the greater the injury to science, since the greater will be the energy diverted from untried fields. It would be much wiser to invite applications, select the man most likely to produce a useful memoir, and award the prize to him if he achieved success. The award of a medal, if of great intrinsic value, would be an unwise expenditure. The Victoria Cross is an example of a successful foundation, highly prized, but of small intrinsic value. If made of gold, it would carry no greater honor, and would be more liable to be stolen, melted down, or pawned. Honorary membership in a famous society, or honorary degrees, have great value if wisely awarded. Both are highly prized, form an excellent stimulus to continued work, and as they are both priceless and without price, they in no way diminish the capacity for work. I recently had occasion to compare the progress in various sciences of different countries, and found that the number of persons elected as foreign associates of the seven great national societies of the world was an excellent test. Eighty-seven persons were members of two or more of these societies. Only six are residents of the United States, while an equal number come from Saxony, which has only a twentieth of the population. Of the six residents here, only three were born in the United States. Not a single mathematician or doctor from this country appears on the list. Only in astronomy are we well represented. Out of a total of ten astronomers, four come from England, and three from the United States. Comparing the results for the last one hundred and fifty years, we find an extraordinary growth for the German races, an equally surprising diminution for the French and other Latin races, while the proportion of Englishmen has remained unchanged. A popular method of expending money, both by countries and by individuals, is in sending expeditions to observe solar eclipses. These appeal both to donors and recipients. The former believe they are making a great contribution to science, while the latter enjoy a long voyage to a distant country, and in case of clouds they are not expected to make any scientific return. If the sky is clear at the time of the eclipse, the newspapers of the next day report that great results have been secured, and after that nothing further is ever heard. Exceptions should be made of the English Eclipse Committee and the Lick Observatory, which, by long-continued study and observation, are gradually solving the difficult problems which can be reached in this way only. The gift of a large telescope to a university is of very doubtful value, unless it is accompanied first by a sum much greater than its cost, necessary to keep it employed in useful work, and secondly to require that it shall be erected not on the university grounds, but in some region, probably mountainous or desert, where results of real value can be obtained. Having thus considered, among others, some of the ways in which astronomy is not likely to be much advanced, we proceed to those which will secure the greatest scientific return for the outlay. One of the best of these is to create a fund to be used in advancing research, subject only to the condition that results of the greatest possible value to science shall be secured. One advantage of this method is that excellent results may be obtained at once from a sum, either large or small. Whatever is at first given may later be increased indefinitely if the results justify it. One of the wisest, as well as the greatest of donors, had said, Find the particular man. 
but unfortunately this plan has been actually tried only with some of the smaller funds. Anyone who will read the list of researchers aided by the Rumford Fund, the Elizabeth Thompson Fund, or the Bruce Fund of 1890 will see that the returns are out of all proportion to the money expended. The trustees of such a fund, as is here proposed, should not regard themselves as patrons conferring a favor on those to whom grants are made, but as men seeking for the means of securing large scientific returns for the money entrusted to them. An astronomer who would aid them in this work, by properly expending a grant, would confer rather than receive a favor. They should search for astronomical bargains, and should try to purchase results where the money could be expended to the best advantage. They should make it their business to learn of the work of every astronomer engaged in original research. A young man who presented a paper of unusual importance at a scientific meeting, or published it in an astronomical journal, would receive a letter inviting him to submit plans to the trustees, if he desired aid in extending his work. In many cases it would be found that, after working for years under most unfavorable conditions, he had developed a method of great value, and had applied it to a few stars, but must now stop for want of means. A small appropriation would enable him to employ an assistant, who, in a short time, could do equally good work. The application of this method to a hundred or a thousand stars would then be only a matter of time and money. The American Astronomical Society met last August at a summer resort on Lake Erie. About thirty astronomers read papers, and in a large portion of these cases the appropriation of a few hundred dollars would have permitted a great extension in these researches. A sad case is that of a brilliant student who may graduate at a college, take a doctor's degree in astronomy, and perhaps pass a year or two in study at a foreign observatory. He then returns to this country, enthusiastic and full of ideas, and considers himself fortunate in securing a position as astronomer in a little country college. He now finds himself overwhelmed with work as a teacher, without time or appliances for original work. What is worse, no one sympathizes with him in his aspirations, and after a few years he abandons hope and settles down to the dull routine of lectures, recitations, and examinations. A little encouragement at the right time, aid by offering to pay for an assistant, for a suitable instrument, or for publishing results, and perhaps a word to the president of his college if the man showed real genius, might make a great astronomer instead of a poor teacher. For several years, a small fund, yielding a few hundred dollars annually, has been dispersed at Harvard in this way, with very encouraging results. A second method of aiding astronomy is through the large observatories. These institutions, if properly managed, have, after years of careful study and trial, developed elaborate systems of solving the great problems of the celestial universe. They are like great factories, which by taking elaborate precautions to save waste at every point, and by improving in every detail both processes and products, are at length obtaining results on a large scale with perfection and economy far greater than is possible by individuals or smaller institutions. The expenses of such an observatory are very large, and it has no pecuniary return since astronomical products are not saleable. A great portion of the original endowment has been spent on the plant, expensive buildings and instruments. Current expenditures, like library expenses, heating, lighting, etc., are independent of the output. It is like a man swimming upstream. He may struggle desperately, and yet make no progress. Any gain in power affects a real advance. This is the condition of nearly all the larger observatories. Their income is mainly used for current expenses, which would be nearly the same whatever their output. A relatively small increase in income can thus be spent to great advantage. The principal instruments are rarely used to their full capacities, and the methods employed could be greatly extended without any addition to the executive or other similar expenses. A man superintending the work of several assistants can often have their number doubled, and his output increased in nearly the same proportion, with no additional expense except the moderate one of their salaries. A single observatory could thus easily do double the work that could be accomplished if its resources were divided between two of half the size. A third, and perhaps the best method of making a real advance in astronomy is by securing the united work of the leading astronomers of the world. The best example of this is the work undertaken in 1870 by the Astronomische Gesellschaft, the great astronomical society of the world. The sky was divided into zones, 
and astronomers were invited to measure the positions of all the stars in those zones. The observation of two of the northern and two of the southern zones were undertaken by American observatories. The zone from plus one degrees to plus five degrees was undertaken by the Chicago Observatory, but was abandoned owing to the Great Fire of 1871, and the work was assumed and carried to completion by the Dudley Observatory at Albany. The zone from plus fifty to plus fifty-five degrees was undertaken by Harvard. An observer and corps of assistants worked on this problem for a quarter of a century. The completed results now fill seven quarto volumes of our annals. Of the southern zones, that from minus fourteen degrees to minus eighteen degrees was undertaken by the Naval Observatory at Washington, and is now finished. The zone from minus ten degrees to minus fourteen degrees was undertaken at Harvard, and a second observer and corps of assistants have been working on it for twenty years. It is now nearly completed, and we hope to begin its publication this year. The other zones were taken by European astronomers. As a result of the whole, we have the precise positions of nearly a hundred and fifty thousand stars, which serve as a basis for the places of all the objects in the sky. Another example of cooperative work is a plan proposed by the writer in 1906 at the celebration of the 200th anniversary of the birth of Franklin. It was proposed first to find the best place in the world for an astronomical observatory, which would probably be in South Africa, to erect there a telescope of the largest size, a reflector of seven feet aperture. This instrument should be kept at work throughout every clear night, taking photographs according to a plan recommended by an international committee of astronomers. The resulting plates should not be regarded as belonging to a single institution, but should be at the service of whoever could make the best use of them. Copies of any, or all, would be furnished at cost to any one who wished for them. As an example of their use, suppose that an astronomer at a little German university should discover a law regulating the stars in clusters. Perhaps he has only a small telescope, near the smoke and haze of a large city, and has no means of securing the photographs he needs. He would apply to the committee, and they would vote that ten photographs of twenty clusters, each with an exposure of an hour, should be taken with the large telescope. This would occupy about a tenth part of the time of the telescope for a year. After making copies, the photographs would be sent to the astronomer, who would perhaps spend ten years in studying and measuring them. The committee would have funds at their disposal to furnish him, if necessary, with suitable measuring instruments assistance for reducing the results, and means for publication. They would thus obtain the services of the most skillful living astronomers, each in his own special line of work, and the latter would obtain in their own homes material for study, the best that the world could supply. Undoubtedly, by such a combination, if properly organized, results could be obtained far better than is now possible by the best individual work, and at a relatively small expense, Many years of preparation will evidently be needed to carry out such a plan, and to save time we have taken the first step and have sent a skilful and experienced observer to South Africa to study its climate and compare it with the experience he has gained during the last twenty years from a similar study of the climate of South America and the western portion of the United States. The next question to be considered is in what direction we may expect the greatest advances in astronomy will be made. Fortunate indeed would be the astronomer who could answer this question correctly. When Ptolemy made the first catalogue of the stars, he little expected that his observations would have any value nearly two thousand years later. The alchemists had no reason to doubt that their results were as important as those of the chemists. The astrologers were respected as much as the astronomers. Although there is a certain amount of fashion in astronomy, yet perhaps the best test is the judgment of those who have devoted their lives to that science. Thirty years ago, the field was narrow. It was the era of big telescopes. Every astronomer wanted a larger telescope than his neighbors with which to measure double stars. If he could not get such an instrument, he measured the positions of the stars with a transit circle. Then came astrophysics, including photography, spectroscopy, and photometry. The study of the motion of the stars along the line of sight, by means of photographs of their spectra, is now the favorite investigation at nearly all the great observatories of the world. The study of the surfaces of the planets, while the favorite subject with the public next to the destruction of the earth by a comet, does not seem to appeal to astronomers. Undoubtedly, the only way to advance our knowledge in this direction is by the most powerful instruments mounted in the best possible locations. 
great astronomers are very conservative, and any sensational story in the newspapers is likely to have but little support from them. Instead of aiding, it greatly injures real progress in science. There is no doubt that during the next half-century much time and energy will be devoted to the study of the fixed stars. The study of their motions, as indicated by their change in position, was pursued with great care by the older astronomers. The apparent motions were so small that a long series of years was required, and, in general, for want of early observations of the precise positions of the faint stars, this work was confined mainly to the bright stars. Photography is yearly adding a vast amount of material available for this study, but the minuteness of the quantities to be measured renders an accurate determination of their laws very difficult. Moreover, we can thus only determine the motions at right angles to the line of sight, the motion towards us or from us being entirely insensible in this way. Then came the discovery of the change in the spectrum when a body was in motion, but still this change was so small that visual observations of it proved of but little value. Attaching a carefully constructed spectroscope to one of the great telescopes of the world, photographing the spectrum of a star, and measuring it with the greatest care, provided a tool of wonderful efficiency. The motion, which sometimes amounts to several hundreds of miles a second, could thus be measured to within a fraction of a mile. The discovery that the motion was variable, owing to the stars revolving around a great dark planet sometimes larger than the star, added greatly not only to the interest of these researchers, but also to the labor involved. Instead of a single measure for each star, in the case of these so-called spectroscopic binaries, we must make enough measures to determine the dimensions of the orbit, its form, and the period of revolution. What has been said of the motions of the stars applies also, in general, to the determination of their distances. A vast amount of labor has been expended on this problem. When at length the distance of a single star was finally determined, the quantity to be measured was so small as to be nearly concealed by the unavoidable errors of measurement. The parallax, or one half of the change in the apparent position of the stars as the earth moves around the sun, has its largest value for the nearest stars. No case has yet been found in which this quantity is as large as a foot rule seen at a distance of fifty miles, and for comparatively few stars is it certainly appreciable. An extraordinary degree of precision has been attained in recent measures of this quantity, but for a really satisfactory solution of this problem we must probably devise some new method, like the use of the spectroscope for determining motions. Two or three illustrations of the kind of methods which might be used to solve this problem may be of interest. There are certain indications of the presence of a selective absorbing medium in space. That is, a medium like red glass, for instance, which would cut off the blue light more than the red light. Such a medium would render the blue end of the spectrum of a distant star much fainter, as compared with the red end, than in the case of a near star. A measure of the relative intensity of the two rays would serve to measure the distance, or the thickness of the absorbing medium. The effect would be the same for all stars of the same class of spectrum. It could be tested by the stars forming a cluster, like the Pleiades, which are doubtless all at nearly the same distance from us. The spectra of stars of the tenth magnitude, or fainter, can't be photographed well enough to be measured in this way, so that the relative distances of nearly a million stars could thus be determined. Another method, which would have a more limited application, would depend on the velocity of light. It has been maintained that the velocity of light in space is not the same for different colors. Certain stars, called algal stars, vary in light at regular intervals when partially eclipsed by the interposition of a large dark satellite. Recent observations of these eclipses, through glass of different colors, show variations in the time of obscuration. Apparently, some of the rays reach the earth sooner than others, though all leave the star at the same time. As the entire time may amount to several centuries, an excessively small difference in velocity would be recognizable. A more delicate test would be to measure the intensity of different portions of the spectrum at a time when the light is changing most rapidly. The effect should be opposite according as the light is increasing or diminishing. It should also show itself in the measures of all spectroscopic binaries. A third method of great promise depends on a remarkable investigation carried on in the physical laboratory of the Case School of Applied Science. According to the undulatory theory of light, all space is filled with a medium called ether, like air, 
but as much more tenuous than air as air is more tenuous than the densest metals. As the earth is moving through space at a rate of several miles a second, we should expect to feel a breeze as we rush through the ether, like that of the air when in an automobile we are moving with but one thousandth part of this velocity. The problem is one of the greatest delicacy, but a former officer of the K school, one of the most eminent of living physicists, devised a method of solving it. The extraordinary result was reached that no breeze was perceptible. This result appeared to be so improbable that it has been tested again and again, but every time, the more delicate the instrument employed, the more certainly is the law established. If we could determine our motion with reference to the ether, we should have a fixed line of reference to which all other motions could be referred. This would give us a line of ever-increasing length from which to measure stellar distances. Still another method depends on the motion of the sun in space. There is some evidence that this motion is not straight, but along a curved line. We see the stars, not as they are now, but as they were when the light left them. In the case of the distant stars, this may have occurred centuries ago. Accordingly, if we measure the motion of the sun from them, and from near stars, a comparison with its actual motion will give us a clue to their distances. Unfortunately, all the stars appeared to have large motions whose law we do not know, and therefore we have no definite starting point, unless we can refer all to the ether, which may be assumed to be at rest. If the views expressed to you this morning are correct, we may expect that the future of astronomy will take the following form. There will be at least one very large observatory, employing one or two hundred assistants, and maintaining three stations. Two of these will be observing stations, one in the western part of the United States, not far from latitude plus thirty, the other similarly situated in the southern hemisphere, probably in South Africa, in latitude minus thirty degrees. The locations will be selected wholly from their climatic conditions. They will be moderately high, from five to ten thousand feet, and in desert regions. The altitude will prevent extreme heat, and clouds or rain will be rare. The range of temperature and unsteadiness of the air will be diminished by placing them on hills a few hundred feet above the surrounding country. The equipment and work of the two stations will be substantially the same. Each will have telescopes and other instruments of the largest size, which will be kept at work throughout the whole of every clear night. The observers will do but little work in the daytime, except perhaps on the sun, and will not undertake much of the computation or reductions. This last work will be carried on at a third station, which will be near a large city where the cost of living and of intellectual labor is low. The photographs will be measured and stored at this station, and all the results will be prepared for publication and printed there. The work of all three stations will be carefully organized so as to obtain the greatest result for a given expenditure. Every inducement will be offered to visiting astronomers who wish to do serious work at either of the stations, and also to students who intend to make astronomy their profession. In the case of photographic investigations, it will be best to send the photographs so that astronomers desiring them can work at home. The work of the young astronomers throughout the world will be watched carefully and large appropriations made to them if it appears that they can spend them to advantage. Similar aid will be rendered to astronomers engaged in teaching, and to anyone, professional or amateur, capable of doing work of the highest grade. As a fundamental condition for success, no restrictions will be made that will interfere with the greatest scientific efficiency, and no personal or local prejudices that will restrict the work. These plans may seem to you visionary, and too utopian for the twentieth century, but they may be nearer fulfillment than we anticipate. The true astronomer of today is eminently a practical man. He does not accept plans of a sensational character. The same qualities are needed in directing a great observatory successfully as in managing a railroad or factory. Any one can propose a gigantic expenditure, but to prove to a shrewd man of affairs that it is feasible and advisable is a very different matter. It is much more difficult to give away money wisely than to earn it. Many men have made great fortunes, but few have learned how to expend money wisely in advancing science, or to give it away judiciously. Many persons have given large sums to astronomy, and some day we shall find the man with broad views who will decide to have the advice and aid of the astronomers of the world in his plans for promoting science, and who will thus expend his money, as he made it, 
taking the greatest care that not one dollar is wasted. Again, let us consider the next great advance, which perhaps will be a method of determining the distances of the stars. Many of us are working on this problem, the solution of which may come to someone at any day. The present field is a wide one, the prospects are now very bright, and we may look forward to as great an advance in the twentieth century as in the nineteenth. May a portion of this come to the case school, and, with your support, may its enviable record in the past be surpassed by its future achievements. End of the Future of Astronomy Hints towards an Essay on Conversation by Jonathan Swift This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Simon. Hints towards an Essay on Conversation by Jonathan Swift I have observed few obvious subjects to have been so seldom, or at least so slightly handled as this, and indeed I know few so difficult to be treated as it ought, nor yet upon which there seemeth so much to be said. Most things pursued by men for the happiness of public or private life, our wit or folly have so refined that they seldom subsist but in idea. A true friend, a good marriage, a perfect form of government, with some others, require so many ingredients, so good in their several kinds, and so much niceness in mixing them, that for some thousands of years men have despaired of reducing their schemes to perfection. But, in conversation, it is, or might be, otherwise. For here we are only to avoid a multitude of errors, which, although a matter of some difficulty, may be in every man's power, for want of which it remaineth as mere an idea as the other. Therefore it seemeth to me that the truest way to understand conversation is to know the faults and errors to which it is subject, and from thence every man to form maxims to himself whereby it may be regulated, because it requireth few talents to which most men are not born, or at least may not acquire without any great genius or study. For nature hath left every man a capacity of being agreeable, though not of shining in company, and there are a hundred men sufficiently qualified for both, who, by a very few faults, that they might correct in half an hour, are not so much as tolerable. I was prompted to write my thoughts upon this subject by mere indignation, to reflect that so useful and innocent a pleasure, so fitted for every period and condition of life, and so much in all men's power, should be so much neglected and abused. And in this discourse it will be necessary to note those errors that are obvious, as well as others which are seldomer observed, since there are few so obvious or acknowledged into which most men, some time or other, are not apt to run. For instance, nothing is more generally exploded than the folly of talking too much. Yet I rarely remember to have seen five people together where some one among them had not been predominant in that kind to the great constraint and disgust of all the rest. But among such as deal in multitudes of words, none are comparable to the sober, deliberate talker, who proceeded with much thought and caution, maketh his preface, brancheth out into several digressions, findeth a hint that putteth him in mind of another story, which he promiseth to tell you when this is done, cometh back regularly to his subject, cannot readily call to mind some person's name, holding his head, complaineth of his memory, the whole company all this while in suspense. At length says, it is no matter, and so goes on. And to crown the business, it perhaps proveth at last a story the company hath heard fifty times before, or at best some insipid adventure of the relator. Another general fault in conversation is that of those who affect to talk of themselves. Some, without any ceremony, will run over the history of their lives will relate the annals of their diseases with the several symptoms and circumstances of them, will enumerate the hardships and injustice they have suffered in court, in parliament, in love, or in law. Others are more dexterous, and with great art will lie on the watch to hook in their own praise. They will call a witness to remember they always foretold what would happen in such a case, but none would believe them. 
They advised such a man from the beginning, and told him the consequences just as they happened, but he would have his own way. Others make a vanity of telling their faults. They are the strangest men in the world. They cannot dissemble. They own it is a folly. They have lost abundance of advantages by it, but if you would give them the world, they cannot help it. There is something in their nature that abhors insincerity and constraint, with many other insufferable topics of the same altitude. Of such mighty importance every man is to himself, and ready to think he is so to others, without once making this easy and obvious reflection, that his affairs can have no more weight with other men than theirs have with him, and how little that is, he is sensible enough. Where company hath met, I often have observed two persons discover, by some accident, that they were bred together at the same school or university, after which the rest are condemned to silence, and to listen while these two are refreshing each other's memory with the arch tricks and passages of themselves and their comrades. I know a great officer of the army, who will sit for some time with a supercilious and impatient silence, full of anger and contempt for those who are talking. At length, of a sudden, demand audience, decide the matter in a short, dogmatical way, then withdraw within himself again, and vouchsafe to talk no more, until his spirits circulate again to the same point. There are some faults in conversation, which none are so subject to as men of wit, nor ever so much as when they are with each other. If they have opened their mouths, without endeavouring to say witty thing, they think it is so many words lost. It is a torment to the hearers, as much as to themselves, to see them upon the wreck for invention, and in perpetual constraint, with so little success. They must do something extraordinary, in order to acquit themselves, and answer their character, else the standers-by may be disappointed, and be apt to think them only like the rest of mortals. I have known two men of wit industriously brought together in order to entertain the company, where they have made a very ridiculous figure, and provided all the mirth at their own expense. I know a man of wit who is never easy but where he can be allowed to dictate and preside. He neither expected to be informed or entertained, but to display his own talents. His business is to be good company and not good conversation, and therefore he chooseth to frequent those who are content to listen and profess themselves his admirers. And indeed, the worst conversation I ever remembered to have heard in my life was that at Will's coffee-house, where the wits, as they were called, used formerly to assemble, that is to say, five or six men who had writ plays, or at least prologues, or had share in a miscellany, came thither, and entertained one another with their trifling composures, in so important an air as if they had been the noblest efforts of human nature." or that the fate of kingdoms depended on them, and they were usually attended with an humble audience of young students from the inns of court or the universities, who, at due distance, listened to these oracles, and returned home with great contempt for their law and philosophy, their heads filled with trash, under the name of politeness, criticism, and belles lettres. By these means the poets, for many years past, were all overrun with pedantry, for, as I take it, the word is not properly used, because pedantry is the too frequent or unseasonable obtruding our own knowledge in common discourse, and placing too great a value upon it, by which definition men of the court or the army may be as guilty of pedantry as a philosopher or a divine. And it is the same vice in women, when they are over-copious upon the subject of their petticoats, or their fans, or their china, for which reason, although it be a piece of prudence as well as good manners to put men upon talking on subjects they are best versed in, yet that is a liberty a wise man could hardly take, because, beside the imputation for pedantry, it is what he would never improve by. The great town is usually provided with some player, mimic, or buffoon, who hath general reception at the good tables, familiar and domestic with persons of the first quality, and usually sent for, at every meeting to divert the company, against which I have no objection. You go there as to a farce or a puppet show. Your business is only to laugh in season, either out of inclination or civility, while this merry companion is acting his part. It is a business he hath undertaken, and we are to suppose he is paid for his day's work. I only quarrel— when in select and private meetings, where men of wit and learning are invited to pass an evening, this jester should be admitted 
to run over his circle of tricks, and make the whole company unfit for any other conversation, besides the indignity of confounding men's talents at so shameful a rate. Raillery is the finest part of conversation, but, as it is our usual custom to counterfeit and adulterate whatever is too dear for us, so we have done with this, and turned it all into what is generally called repartee, or being smart. Just as when an expensive fashion cometh up, those who are not able to reach it content themselves with some paltry imitation. It now passeth for raillery to run a man down in discourse, to put him out of countenance, and make him ridiculous, sometimes to expose the defects of his person or understanding, on all which occasions he is obliged not to be angry, to avoid the imputation of not being able to take a jest. It is admirable to observe one who is dexterous at this art, singling out a weak adversary, getting the laugh on his side, and then carrying all before him. The French, from whence we borrow the word, have a quite different idea of the thing, and so had we in the politer age of our fathers. Raillery was to say something that at first appeared a reproach or reflection, but, by some turn of wit unexpected and surprising, ended always in a compliment, and to the advantage of the person it was addressed to. And surely one of the best rules in conversation is never to say a thing which any of the company can reasonably wish we had rather left unsaid nor can there anything be well more contrary to the ends for which people meet together than to part unsatisfied with each other or themselves. There are two faults in conversation which appear very different, yet arise from the same root, and are equally blamable. I mean an impatience to interrupt others, and the uneasiness of being interrupted ourselves. The two chief ends of conversation are to entertain and improve those we are among, or to receive those benefits ourselves, which, whoever will consider, cannot easily run into either of those two errors, because when any man speaketh in company, it is to be supposed he doth it for his hearer's sake, and not his own, so that common discretion will teach us not to force their intention if they are not willing to lend it, nor on the other side to interrupt him who is in possession, because that is in the grossest manner to give the preference to our own good sense." There are some people whose good manners will not suffer them to interrupt you, but what is almost as bad will discover abundance of impatience and lie upon the watch until you have done, because they have started something in their own thoughts which they long to be delivered of. Meantime, they are so far from regarding what passes that their imaginations are wholly turned upon what they have in reserve, for fear it should slip out of their memory." and thus they confine their invention, which might otherwise range over a hundred things full as good, and that might be much more naturally introduced. There is a sort of rude familiarity which some people, by practising among their intimates, have introduced into their general conversation, and would have it pass for innocent freedom or humour, which is a dangerous experiment in our northern climate, where all the little decorum and politeness we have are purely forced by art, and are so ready to lapse into barbarity. This, among the Romans, was the raillery of slaves, of which we have many instances in Plautus. It seemeth to have been introduced among us by Cromwell, who, by preferring the scum of the people, made it a court entertainment, of which I have heard many particulars. And, considering all things were turned upside down, it was reasonable and judicious, although it was a piece of policy found out to ridicule a point of honour in the other extreme, when the smallest word misplaced among gentlemen ended in a duel. There are some men excellent at telling a story, and provided with a plentiful stock of them, which they can draw out upon occasion in all companies, and, considering how low conversation runs now among us, it is not altogether a contemptible talent. However, it is subject to two unavoidable defects— frequent repetition, and being soon exhausted, so that whoever valued this gift in himself had need of a good memory, and ought frequently to shift his company, that he may not discover the weakness of his fund. For those who are thus endowed have seldom any other revenue, but live upon the main stock. Great speakers in public are seldom agreeable in private conversation, whether their faculty be natural or acquired by practice, and often venturing. Natural elocution, although it may seem a paradox, 
usually springeth from a barrenness of invention and of words by which men who have only one stock of notions upon every subject, and one set of phrases to express them in, they swim upon the superficies, and offer themselves on every occasion. Therefore, men of much learning, and who know the compass of a language, are generally the worst talkers on a sudden, until much practice hath inured and emboldened them, because they are confounded with plenty of matter, variety of notions and of words which they cannot readily choose, but are perplexed and entangled by too great a choice, which is no disadvantage in private conversation, where, on the other side, the talent of haranguing is, of all others, most insupportable. Nothing hath spoiled men more for conversation than the character of being wits, to support which they never fail of encouraging a number of followers and admirers, who list themselves in their service, wherein they find their accounts on both sides by pleasing their mutual vanity. This hath given the former such an air of superiority, and made the latter so pragmatical, that neither of them are well to be endured. I say nothing here of the itch of dispute and contradiction, telling of lies, or of those who are troubled with a disease called the wandering of the thoughts, that they are never present in mind at what passeth in discourse. For whoever labours under any of these possessions is as unfit for conversation as a madman in Bedlam. I think I have gone over most of the errors in conversation that have fallen under my notice or memory, except some that are merely personal, and others too gross to need exploding, such as lewd or profane talk but I pretend only to treat the errors of conversation in general, and not the several subjects of discourse, which would be infinite. Thus we see how human nature is most debased, by the abuse of that faculty which has held the great distinction between men and brutes, and how little advantage we make of that which might be the greatest, the most lasting, and the most innocent, as well as useful pleasure of life. In default of which we are forced to take up with those poor amusements of dress and visiting, or the more pernicious ones of play, drink, and vicious amours, whereby the nobility and gentry of both sexes are entirely corrupted both in body and mind, and have lost all notions of love, honour, friendship, generosity, which, under the name of fopperies, have been for some time laughed out of doors. This degeneracy of conversation, with the pernicious consequences thereof upon our humours and dispositions, hath been owing, among other causes, to the custom arisen, for some time past, of excluding women from any share in our society, further than in parties at play, or dancing, or in pursuit of an amour. I take the highest period of politeness in England, and it is of the same date in France, to have been the peaceable part of King Charles I's reign and from what we read of those times, as well as from the accounts I have formerly met with from some who lived in that court, the methods then used for raising and cultivating conversation were altogether different from ours. Several ladies, whom we find celebrated by the poets of that age, had assemblies at their houses, where persons of the best understanding, and of both sexes, met to pass the evenings in discoursing upon whatever agreeable subjects were occasionally started, and although we are apt to ridicule the sublime platonic notions they had, or personated in love and friendship, I conceive their refinements were grounded upon reason, and that a little grain of the romance is no ill ingredient to preserve and exalt the dignity of human nature, without which it is apt to degenerate into everything that is sordid, vicious, and low. If there were no other use in the conversation of ladies, it is sufficient that it would lay a restraint upon those odious topics of immodesty and indecencies into which the rudeness of our northern genius is so apt to fall. And therefore it is observable in those sprightly gentlemen about the town who are so very dexterous at entertaining a visit mask in the park or at the playhouse, that in the company of ladies of virtue and honour they are silent and disconcerted and out of their element. There are some people who think they sufficiently acquit themselves and entertain their company with relating of facts of no consequence, nor at all out of the road of such common incidents as happen every day. And this I have observed more frequently among the Scots than any other nation, who are very careful not to admit the minute circumstances of time or place, which kind of discourse, if it were not a little relieved by the uncouth terms and phrases, as well as accent and gesture, 
peculiar to that country, would be hardly tolerable. It is not a fault in company to talk much, but to continue it long is certainly one. For, if the majority of those who are got together be naturally silent or cautious, the conversation will flag, unless it be often renewed by one among them, who can start new subjects, provided he doth not dwell upon them, but leaveth room for answers and replies. End of Hints Towards an Essay on Conversation by Jonathan Swift The Hypocrisy of Puritanism by Emma Goldman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hypocrisy of Puritanism by Emma Goldman From Anarchy and Other Essays Speaking of Puritanism in relation to American art, Mr. Goodsum Burglum said, Puritanism has made us self-centered and hypocritical for so long that sincerity and reverence for what is natural in our impulses have been fairly bred out of us, with the result that there can be neither truth nor individuality in our art. Mr. Berglum might have added that Puritanism has made life itself impossible. More than art, more than asceticism, life represents beauty in a thousand variations. It is, indeed, a gigantic panorama of eternal change. Puritanism, on the other hand, rests on a fixed and immovable conception of life. It is based on the Calvinistic idea that life is a curse, imposed upon man by the wrath of God. In order to redeem himself, man must do constant penance, must repudiate every natural and healthy impulse, and turn his back on joy and beauty. Puritanism celebrated its reign of terror in England during the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, destroying and crushing every manifestation of art and culture. It was the spirit of Puritanism which robbed Shelley of his children, because he would not bow to the dicta of religion. It was the same narrow spirit which alienated Byron from his native land, because that great genius rebelled against the monotony, dullness, and pettiness of his country. It was Puritanism, too, that forced some of England's freest women into the conventional lie of marriage, Mary Wollstonecraft and later George Eliot. And recently Puritanism has demanded another toll, the life of Oscar Wilde. In fact, Puritanism has never ceased to be the most pernicious factor in the domain of John Bull, acting as censor of the artistic expression of his people and stamping its approval only on the dullness of middle-class respectability. It is therefore sheer British jingoism which points to America as the country of Puritanic provincialism. It is quite true that our life is stunted by Puritanism, and that the latter is killing what is natural and healthy in our impulses. But it is equally true that it is to England that we are indebted for transplanting this spirit on American soil. It was bequeathed to us by the Pilgrim Fathers. Fleeing from persecution and oppression, the Pilgrims of Mayflower fame established in the New World a reign of Puritanic tyranny and crime. The history of New England, and especially of Massachusetts, is full of the horrors that have turned life into gloom, joy into despair, naturalness into disease, honesty and truth into hideous lies and hypocrisies. The ducking stool and whipping post, as well as numerous other devices of torture, were the favorite English methods for American purification. Boston, the city of culture, has gone down in the annals of Puritanism as the bloody town. It rivaled Salem even in her cruel persecution of unauthorized religious opinions. On the now famous common, a half-naked woman with a baby in her arms was publicly whipped for the crime of free speech, and on the same spot Mary Dyer, another Quaker woman, was hanged in 1659. In fact, Boston has been the scene of more than one wanton crime committed by Puritanism. Salem, in the summer of 1692, killed eighteen people for witchcraft. Nor was Massachusetts alone in driving out the devil by fire and brimstone. As Canning justly said, the Pilgrim Fathers infested the New World to redress the balance of the old. The horrors of that period have found their most supreme expression in the American classic, The Scarlet Letter. Puritanism no longer employs the thumbscrew and lash, but it still has a most pernicious hold on the minds and feelings of the American people. Naught else can explain the power of a Comstock. Like the Torquemadas of antebellum days, Anthony Comstock is the autocrat of American morals. He dictates the standards of good and evil, 
of purity and vice. Like a thief in the night, he sneaks into the private lives of the people, into their most intimate relations. The system of espionage established by this man Comstock puts to shame the infamous third division of the Russian secret police. Why does the public tolerate such an outrage on its liberties? Simply because Comstock is but the loud expression of the Puritanism bred in the Anglo-Saxon blood, and from whose thraldom even liberals have not succeeded in fully emancipating themselves. The visionless and leaden elements of the old young men's and women's Christian temperance unions, purity leagues, American Sabbath unions, and the Prohibition Party, with Anthony Comstock as their patron saint, are the grave-diggers of American art and culture. Europe can at least boast of a bold art and literature which delve deeply into the social and sexual problems of our time, exercising a severe critique of all our shams. As with a surgeon's knife, every puritanic carcass is dissected, and the way thus cleared for man's liberation from the dead weights of the past. But with Puritanism as the constant check upon American life, neither truth nor sincerity is possible. Nothing but gloom and mediocrity to dictate human conduct, curtail natural expression, and stifle our best impulses. Puritanism in this the twentieth century is as much the enemy of freedom and beauty as it was when it landed on Plymouth Rock. It repudiates as something vile and sinful our deepest feelings, but being absolutely ignorant as to the real functions of human emotions, Puritanism is itself the creator of the most unspeakable vices. The entire history of asceticism proves this to be only too true. The Church, as well as Puritanism, has fought the flesh as something evil. It had to be subdued and hidden at all cost. The result of this vicious attitude is only now beginning to be recognized by modern thinkers and educators. They realize that, quote, Nakedness has a hygienic value as well as a spiritual significance, far beyond its influences in allaying the natural inquisitiveness of the young or acting as a preventative of morbid emotion. It is an inspiration to adults who have long outgrown any youthful curiosities. The vision of the essential and eternal human form, the nearest thing to us in all the world, with its vigor and its beauty and its grace, is one of the prime tonics of life." Unquote. From The Psychology of Sex by Havelock Ellis But the spirit of purism has so perverted the human mind that it has lost the power to appreciate the beauty of nudity, forcing us to hide the natural form under the plea of chastity. Yet chastity itself is but an artificial imposition upon nature, expressive of a false shame of the human form. The modern idea of chastity, especially in reference to women, its greatest victim, is but the sensuous exaggeration of our natural impulses. Quote, chastity varies with the amount of clothing, unquote, and hence Christians and purists forever hasten to cover the quote, heathen unquote, with tatters, and thus convert him to goodness and chastity. Puritanism, with its perversion of the significance and functions of the human body, especially in regard to woman, has condemned her to celibacy, or to the indiscriminate breeding of a diseased race, or to prostitution. The enormity of this crime against humanity is apparent when we consider the results. Absolute sexual continence is imposed upon the unmarried woman, under pain of being considered immoral or fallen, with the result of producing neurasthenia, impotence, depression, and a great variety of nervous complaints involving diminished power of work, limited enjoyment of life, sleeplessness, and preoccupation with sexual desires and imaginings. The arbitrary and pernicious dictum of total continence probably also explains the mental inequality of the sexes. Thus Freud believes that the intellectual inferiority of so many women is due to the inhibition of thought imposed upon them for the purpose of sexual repression. Having thus suppressed the natural sex desires of the unmarried woman, Puritanism, on the other hand, blesses her married sister for incontinent fruitfulness in wedlock. Indeed, not merely blesses her, but forces the woman, oversexed by previous repression, to bear children, irrespective of weakened physical condition or economic inability to rear a large family. Prevention, even by scientifically determined safe methods, is absolutely prohibited, nay, the very mention of the subject is considered criminal. Thanks to this puritanic tyranny, the majority of women soon find themselves at the ebb of their physical resources. Ill and worn, they are utterly unable to give their children even elementary care. That, added to economic pressure, forces many women to risk utmost danger rather than to continue to bring forth life. 
the custom of procuring abortions has reached such vast proportions in America as to be almost beyond belief. According to recent investigations along this line, seventeen abortions are committed in every hundred pregnancies. This fearful percentage represents only cases which come to the knowledge of physicians. Considering the secrecy in which this practice is necessarily shrouded, and the consequent professional inefficiency and neglect, Puritanism continuously exacts thousands of victims to its own stupidity and hypocrisy. Prostitution, although hounded, imprisoned, and chained, is nevertheless the greatest triumph of Puritanism. It is its most cherished child, all hypocritical sanctimoniousness notwithstanding. The prostitute is the fury of our century, sweeping across the civilized countries like a hurricane, and leaving a trail of disease and disaster. The only remedy Puritanism offers for this ill-begotten child is greater repression and more merciless persecution. The latest outrage is represented by the Page Law, which imposes upon New York the terrible failure and crime of Europe, namely, registration and segregation of the unfortunate victims of Puritanism. In equally stupid manner, Purism seeks to check the terrible scourge of its own creation, venereal diseases. Most disheartening it is that this spirit of obtuse narrow-mindedness has poisoned even our so-called liberals, and has blinded them into joining the crusade against the very things born of the hypocrisy of Puritanism, prostitution, and its results. In willful blindness, Puritanism refuses to see that the true method of prevention is the one which makes it clear to all that, quote, venereal diseases are not a mysterious or terrible thing, the penalty of the sin of the flesh, a sort of shameful evil branded by purist malediction, but an ordinary disease which may be treated and cured, unquote. By its methods of obscurity, disguise, and concealment, Puritanism has furnished favorable conditions for the growth and spread of these diseases. Its bigotry is again most strikingly demonstrated by the senseless attitude in regard to the great discovery of Professor Ehrlich, hypocrisy veiling the important cure for syphilis with vague allusions to a remedy for a certain poison. The almost limitless capacity of Puritanism for evil is due to its entrenchment behind the state and the law. Pretending to safeguard the people against immorality, it has impregnated the machinery of government and added to its usurpation of moral guardianship the legal censorship of our views, feelings, and even of our conduct. Art, literature, the drama, the privacy of the males, in fact our most intimate tastes, are at the mercy of this inexorable tyrant. Anthony Comstock, or some other equally ignorant policeman, has been given the power to desecrate genius, to soil and mutilate the sublimest creation of nature, the human form. Books dealing with the most vital issues of our lives and seeking to shed light upon dangerously obscured problems, are legally treated as criminal offenses, and their helpless authors thrown into prison, or driven to destruction and death. Not even in the domain of the Tsar is personal liberty daily outraged to the extent it is in America, the stronghold of the Puritanic eunuchs. Here, the only day of recreation left to the masses, Sunday, has been made hideous and utterly impossible. All writers on primitive customs and ancient civilization agree that the Sabbath was a day of festivities, free from care and duties, a day of general rejoicing and merrymaking. In every European country this tradition continues to bring some relief from the humdrum and stupidity of our Christian error. Everywhere concert halls, theaters, museums, and gardens are filled with men, women, and children, particularly workers with their families, full of life and joy, forgetful of the ordinary rules and conventions of their everyday existence. It is on that day that the masses demonstrate what life might really mean in a sane society, with work stripped of its profit-making, soul-destroying purpose. Puritanism has robbed the people even of that one day. Naturally only the workers are affected. Our millionaires have their luxurious homes and elaborate clubs. The poor, however, are condemned to the monotony and dullness of the American Sunday. The sociability and fun of European outdoor life is here exchanged for the gloom of the church, the stuffy, germ-saturated country parlor, or the brutalizing atmosphere of the backroom saloon. In Prohibition states, the people lack even the latter, unless they can invest their meager earnings in quantities of adulterated liquor. As to Prohibition, everyone knows what a farce it really is. Like all other achievements of Puritanism, it too has but driven the devil deeper into the human system. Nowhere else does one meet so many drunkards as in our prohibition towns. 
but so long as one can use scented candy to abate the foul breath of hypocrisy, Puritanism is triumphant. Ostensibly prohibition is opposed to liquor for reasons of health and economy, but the very spirit of prohibition being itself abnormal, it succeeds but in creating an abnormal life. Every stimulus which quickens the imagination and raises the spirits is as necessary to our life as air. It invigorates the body and deepens our vision of human fellowship. Without stimuli, in one form or another, creative work is impossible, nor indeed the spirit of kindliness and generosity. The fact that some great geniuses have seen their reflection in the goblet too frequently does not justify Puritanism in attempting to fetter the whole gamut of human emotions. A Byron and a Poe have stirred humanity deeper than all the Puritans can ever hope to do. The former have given to life meaning and color. The latter are turning red blood into water, beauty into ugliness, variety into uniformity and decay. Puritanism, in whatever expression, is a poisonous germ. On the surface everything may look strong and vigorous, yet the poison works its way persistently until the entire fabric is doomed. With Hippolyte Taine, every truly free spirit has come to realize that Puritanism is the death of culture, philosophy, humor, and good fellowship. Its characteristics are dullness, monotony, and gloom. End of the Hypocrisy of Puritanism by Emma Goldman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness. On English Composition and Other Matters by Samuel Butler. This essay is believed to be the first composition by Samuel Butler that appeared in print. It was published in the first number of The Eagle, a magazine written and edited by members of St. John's College, Cambridge, in the Lent term, 1858, when Butler was in his fourth and last year of residence. From The Eagle, Volume 1, Number 1, Lent term, 1858, page 41. I sit down scarcely knowing how to grasp my own meaning and give it a tangible shape in words, and yet it is concerning this very expression of our thoughts in words that I wish to speak. As I muse, things fall more into their proper places, and little fit for the task, as my confession pronounces me to be, I will try to make clear that which is in my mind. I think, then, that the style of our authors of a couple of hundred years ago was more terse and masculine than that of those of the present day, possessing both more of the graphic element and more vigor, straightforwardness, and conciseness. Most readers will have anticipated me in admitting that a man should be clear of his meaning before he endeavors to give to it any kind of utterance, and that having made up his mind what to say, the less thought he takes how to say it, more than briefly, pointedly, and plainly, the better. For instance, Bacon tells us, Men fear death as children fear to go in the dark. He does not say, what I can imagine a last century writer to have said, a feeling somewhat analogous to the dread with which children are affected upon entering a dark room, is that which most men entertain at the contemplation of death. Jeremy Taylor says, Tell them it is as much intemperance to weep too much as to laugh too much. He does not say all men will acknowledge that laughing admits of intemperance, but some men may at first sight hesitate to allow that a similar imputation may be at times attached to weeping. I incline to believe that as irons support the rickety child whilst they impede the healthy one, so rules, for the most part, are but useful to the weaker among us. Our greatest masters in the language, whether prose or verse, in painting, music, architecture, or the like, have been those who preceded the rule, and whose excellence gave rise thereto. Men who preceded, I should rather say, not the rule, but the discovery of the rule, men whose intuitive perception led them to the right practice. We cannot imagine Homer to have studied rules, and the infant genius of those giants of their art, Handel, Mozart, and Beethoven, who composed at the ages of seven, five, and ten, must certainly have been unfettered by them. To the less brilliantly endowed, however, they have a use as being compendious safeguards against error. Let me then lay down as the best of all rules for writing, forgetfulness of self and carefulness of the matter in hand. 
No simile is out of place that illustrates the subject. In fact, a simile, as showing the symmetry of this world's arrangement, is always, if a fair one, interesting. Every simile is a miss that leads the mind from the contemplation of its object to the contemplation of its author. This will apply equally to the heaping up of unnecessary illustrations. It is as great a fault to supply the reader with too many as with too few. Having given him at most two, it is better to let him read slowly and think out the rest for himself than to surfeit him with an abundance of explanation. Hood says well, and thus upon the public mind intrude it, as if I thought, like Otahiatin Cook's, no food was fit to eat till I had chewed it. A book that is worth reading will be worth reading thoughtfully, and there are but few good books, save certain novels, that it is well to read in an armchair. Most will bear standing to. At the present time we seem to lack the impassiveness and impartiality which was so marked among the writings of our forefathers. We are seldom content with the simple narration of fact, but must rush off into an almost declamatory description of them. My meaning will be plain to all who have studied Thucydides. The dignity of his simplicity is, I think, marred by those who put in the accessories which seem thought necessary in all present histories. How few writers of the present day would not, instead of, a Greek phrase, rather write, night fell upon this horrid scene of bloodshed. This is somewhat a matter of taste, but I think I shall find some to agree with me in preferring for plain narration, of course I exclude oratory, the unadorned gravity of Thucydides. There are, indeed, some writers of the present day who seem returning to the statement of facts rather than their adornment, but these are not the most generally admired. This simplicity, however, to be truly effective, must be unstudied. It will not do to write with affected terseness, a charge which I think may be fairly preferred against Tacitus. Such a style, if ever effective, must be so from excess of artifice, and not from that artlessness of simplicity which I should wish to see prevalent among us. Neither again is it well to write and go over the ground again with the pruning knife, though this fault is better than the other, to take care of the matter and let the words take care of themselves is the best safeguard. To this I shall be answered, yes, but is not a diamond cut and polished a more beautiful object than when rough? I grant it, and more valuable inasmuch as it has run chance of spoliation in the cutting, but I maintain that the thinking man, the man whose thoughts are great and worth the consideration of others, will deal in proprieties, and will from the mine of his thought produce ready-cut diamonds, or rather will cut them there spontaneously, ere ever they see the light of day. There are a few points still which it were well we should consider. We are all too apt, when we sit down to study a subject, to have already formed our opinion, and to weave all matter to the warp of our preconceived judgment, to fall in with the received idea, and, with biased minds, unconsciously to follow in the wake of public opinion, while professing to lead it. To the best of my belief, half the dogmatism of those we daily meet is in consequence of the unwitting practice of this self-deception. Simply let us not talk about what we do not understand, save as learners, and we shall not by writing mislead others. There is no shame in being obliged to others for opinions. The shame is not being honest enough to acknowledge it. I would have no one omit to put down a useful thought because it was not his own, provided it tended to the better expression of his matter, and he did not conceal its source. Let him, however, set out the borrowed capital to interest. One word more, and I have done. With regard to our subject, the best rule is not to write concerning that about which we cannot, at our present age, know anything, save by a process which is commonly called cram. On all such matters there are abler writers than ourselves, the men, in fact, from whom we cram. Never let us hunt after a subject, unless we have something which we feel urged on to say. It is better to say nothing. Who are so ridiculous as those who talk for the sake of talking, save only those who write for the sake of writing? But there are subjects which all young men think about. Who can take a walk in our streets and not think? The most trivial incident has ramifications, to whose guidance, if we surrender our thoughts, we are oft-times led upon a gold-mine unawares, and no man, whether old or young, is worse for reading the ingenious and unaffected statement of a young man's thoughts. There are some things in which experience blunts the mental vision, as well as others in which it sharpens it. 
The former are best described by younger men. Our province is not to lead public opinion, is not, in fact, to ape our seniors and transport ourselves from our proper sphere. It is rather to show ourselves as we are, to throw our thoughts before the public as they rise, without requiring it to imagine that we are right and others wrong. But hoping for the forbearance which I must beg the reader to concede to myself, and trusting to the genuineness and vigor of our design to attract it may be more than a passing attention. I am aware that I have digressed from the original purpose of my essay, but I hope for pardon if, believing the digression to be of more value than the original matter, I have not checked my pen, but let it run on even as my heart directed it. Solarius End of On English Composition and Other Matters by Samuel Butler Recorded by Brian Ness The Somnambulists from Revolution and Other Essays by Jack London Read by Brian Ness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Tis only fools speak evil of the clay. The very stars are made of clay like mine. The mightiest and absurdest sleepwalker on the planet, chained in the circle of his own imaginings, man is only too keen to forget his origin and to shame that flesh of his that bleeds like all flesh and that is good to eat. Civilization, which is part of the circle of his imaginings, has spread a veneer over the surface of the soft-shelled animal known as man. It is a very thin veneer, but so wonderfully is man constituted that he squirms on his bit of achievement and believes he is garbed in armor plate. Yet man today is the same man that drank from his enemy's skull in the dark German forests, that sacked cities and stole his women from neighboring clans like any howling aborigine. The flesh and blood body of man has not changed in the last several thousand years, nor has his mind changed. There is no faculty of the mind of man today that did not exist in the minds of the men of long ago. Man has today no concept that is too wide and deep and abstract for the mind of Plato or Aristotle to grasp. Give to Plato or Aristotle the same fund of knowledge that man today has access to, and Plato and Aristotle would reason as profoundly as the man of today and would achieve very similar conclusions. It is the same old animal man, smeared over, it is true, with a veneer, thin and magical, that makes him dream drunken dreams of self-exaltation, and to sneer at the flesh and the blood of him beneath the smear. The raw animal crouching within him is like the earthquake monster pent in the crust of the earth, as he persuades himself against the latter, till it arouses and shakes down a city, so does he persuade himself against the former until it shakes him out of his dreaming and he stands undisguised a brute like any other brute starve him let him miss six meals and see gape through the veneer the hungry maw of the animal beneath get between him and the female of his kind upon whom his mating instinct is bent and see his eyes blaze like an angry cat's hear in his throat the scream of wild stallions and watch his fists clench like an orangutan's Maybe he will even beat his chest, touch his silly vanity, which he exalts into high-sounding pride, call him a liar, and behold the red animal in him that makes a hand clutching that is quick like the tensing of a tiger's claw or an eagle's talon, incarnate with desire to rip and tear. It is not necessary to call him a liar to touch his vanity. Tell a Plains Indian that he has failed to steal horses from the neighboring tribe, or tell a man living in bourgeois society that he has failed to pay his bills at the neighboring grocer's, and the results are the same. Each, Plains Indian and bourgeois, is smeared with a slightly different veneer, that is all. It requires a slightly different stick to scrape it off. The raw animals beneath are identical. But intrude not violently upon man. Leave him alone in his somnambulism, and he kicks out from under his feet the ladder of life up which he has climbed, constitutes himself the center of the universe, dreams sordidly about his own particular god, and maunders metaphysically about his own blessed immortality. True, he lives in a real world, breathes real air, eats real food, and sleeps under real blankets in order to keep real cold away. And there's the rub. 
he has to effect adjustments with the real world and at the same time maintain the sublimity of his dream. The result of this admixture of the real and the unreal is confusion thrice confounded. The man that walks the real world in his sleep becomes such a tangled mass of contradictions, paradoxes, and lies that he has to lie to himself in order to stay asleep. In passing, it may be noted that some men are remarkably constituted in this matter of self-deception. They excel at deceiving themselves, they believe, and they help others to believe, it becomes their function in society, and some of them are paid large salaries for helping their fellow men to believe, for instance, that they are not as other animals, for helping the king to believe, and his parasites and drudges as well, that he is God's own manager over so many square miles of earth crust, for helping the merchant and banking classes to believe that society rests on their shoulders, and that civilization would go to smash if they got out from under and ceased from their exploitations and petty pilferings. Prize-fighting is terrible. This is the dictum of the man who walks in his sleep. He prates about it, and writes to the papers about it, and worries the legislators about it. There is nothing of the brood about him. He is a sublimated soul that treads the heights and breathes refined ether, in self-comparison with the prize-fighter. The man who walks in his sleep ignores the flesh and all its wonderful play of muscle, joint, and nerve. He feels that there is something godlike in the mysterious deeps of his being, denies his relationship with the brute, and proceeds to go forth into the world and express by deeds that something godlike within him. He sits at a desk and chases dollars through the weeks and months and years of his life. To him, the life godlike resolves into a problem something like this. Since the great mass of men toil at producing wealth, how best can he get between the great mass of men and the wealth they produce, and get a slice for himself? With tremendous exercise of craft, deceit, and guile, he devotes his life godlike to this purpose. As he succeeds, his somnambulism grows profound. He bribes legislatures, buys judges, controls primaries, and then goes and hires other men to tell him that it is all glorious and right. And the funniest thing about it is that this arch-deceiver believes all that they tell him. He reads only the newspapers and magazines that tell him what he wants to be told, listens only to the biologists who tell him that he is the finest product of the struggle for existence, and herds only with the, his own kind, where, like the monkey folk, they teeter up and down and tell one another how great they are. In the course of his life godlike, he ignores the flesh until he gets to the table. He raises his hands in horror at the thought of the brutish prize-fighter, and then sits down and gorges himself on roast beef, rare and red, running blood from under every sawing thrust of the implement called a knife. He has a piece of cloth, which he calls a napkin, with which he wipes from his lips, and from the hair on his lips, the greasy juices of the meat. He is fastidiously nauseated at the thought of two prize-fighters bruising each other with their fists, and at the same time, because it will cost him some money, he will refuse to protect the machines in his factory, though he is aware that the lack of such protection every year mangles, batters, and destroys, out of all humanness, thousands of working men, women, and children. He will chatter about things refined and spiritual and godlike like himself, and he and the men who herd with him will calmly adulterate the commodities they put upon the market, and which annually kill tens of thousands of babies and young children. He will recoil at the suggestion of the horrid spectacle of two men confronting each other with gloved hands in the roped arena, and at the same time he will clamor for larger armies and larger navies, for more destructive war machines, which, with a single discharge, will disrupt and rip to pieces more human beings than have died in the whole history of prize-fighting. He will bribe a city council for a franchise or a state legislature for a commercial privilege, but he has never been known in all his sleepwalking history to bribe any legislative body in order to achieve any moral end, such as, for instance, abolition of prize-fighting, child labor laws, pure food bills, or old age pensions. Ah, but we do not stand for the commercial life, object the refined scholarly and professional men. They are also sleepwalkers. They do not stand for the commercial life, but neither did they stand against it with all their strength. They submit to it, to the brutality and carnage of it, they develop classical economists who announce that the only possible way for men and women to get food and shelter is by the existing method. 
they produce university professors, men who claim the role of teachers, and who at the same time claim that the austere ideal of learning is passionless pursuit of passionless intelligence. They serve the men who lead the commercial life, give to their sons somnambulistic educations, preach that sleepwalking is the only way to walk, and that the persons who walk otherwise are atavisms or anarchists. They paint pictures for the commercial men, write books for them, sing songs for them, act plays for them, and dose them with various drugs when their bodies have grown gross or dyspeptic from overeating and lack of exercise. Then there are the good kind somnambulists, who don't prize fight, who don't play the commercial game, who don't teach and preach somnambulism, who don't do anything except live on the dividends that are coined out of the wan white fluid that runs in the veins of little children out of mother's tears, the blood of strong men, and the groans and sighs of the old. The receiver is as bad as the thief. Aye, and the thief is finer than the receiver. He at least has the courage to run the risk. But the good, kind people who don't do anything won't believe this, and the assertion will make them angry, for a moment. They possess several magic phrases which are like the incantations of a voodoo doctor driving devils away. The phrases that the good, kind people repeat to themselves and to one another sound like abstinence, temperance, thrift, virtue. Sometimes they say them backward when they sound like prodigality, drunkenness, wastefulness, and immorality. They do not really know the meaning of these phrases, but they think they do, and that is all that is necessary for somnambulists. The calm repetition of such phrases invariably drives away the waking devils and lulls to slumber. Our statesmen sell themselves and their country for gold. Our municipal servants and state legislators commit countless treasons. The world of graft, the world of betrayal, the world of somnambulism, whose exalted and sensitive citizens are outraged by the knockouts of the prize ring, and who annually not merely knock out, but kill thousands of babies and children by means of child labor and adulterated food. Far better to have the front of one's face pushed in by the fist of an honest prize-fighter, than to have the lining of one's stomach corroded by the embalmed beef of a dishonest manufacturer. In a prize-fight men are classed. A lightweight fights with a lightweight. He never fights with a heavyweight, and foul blows are not allowed. Yet in the world of the somnambulists, where soar the sublimated spirits, there are no classes, and foul blows are continually struck and never disallowed. Only they are not called foul blows. The world of claw and fang and fist and club has passed away, so say the somnambulists. A rebate is not an elongated claw. A Wall Street raid is not a fang slash. Dummy boards of directors and fake accountings are not foul blows of the fist under the belt. A present of a coal stock by a mine operator to a railroad official is not a claw rip to the bowels of a rival mine operator. The hundred million dollars with which a combination beats down to his knees a man with a million dollars is not a club. The man who walks in his sleep says it is not a club. So say all of his kind with which he herds. They gather together and solemnly and gloatingly make and repeat certain noises that sound like discretion, acumen, initiative, enterprise. These noises are especially gratifying when they are made backward. They mean the same thing, but they sound different. And in either case, forward or backward, the spirit of the dream is not disturbed. When a man strikes a foul blow in the prize ring, the fight is immediately stopped. He is declared the loser, and he is hissed by the audience as he leaves the ring. But when a man who walks in his sleep strikes a foul blow, he is immediately declared the victor and awarded the prize. And, amid acclamations, he forthwith turns his prize into a seat in the United States Senate, into a grotesque palace on Fifth Avenue and into endowed churches, universities, and libraries, to say nothing of subsidized newspapers, to proclaim his greatness. The red animal in the somnambulist will out. He decries the carnal combat of the prize ring, and compels the red animal to spiritual combat. The poisoned lie, the nasty, gossiping tongue, the brutality of the unkind epigram, the business and social nastiness and treachery of today, these are the thrusts and scratches of the red animal, when the somnambulist is in charge, they are not the uppercuts and short arm jabs and jolts and slugging blows of the spirit. They are the foul blows of the spirit that have never been disbarred, as the foul blows of the prize ring have been disbarred. 
would it not be preferable for a man to strike one full on the mouth with his fist than for him to tell a lie about one or malign those who are nearest and dearest? But these are the crimes of the spirit, and alas, they are so much more frequent than blows on the mouth. And whoever exalts the spirit over the flesh by his own creed avers that a crime of the spirit is vastly more terrible than a crime of the flesh. Thus stand the somnambulists convicted by their own creed, only they are not real men, alive and awake, and they proceed to mutter magic phrases that dispel all doubt as to their undiminished and eternal gloriousness. It is well enough to let the ape and tiger die, but it is hardly fair to kill off the natural and courageous apes and tigers and allow the spawn of cowardly apes and tigers to live. The prize-fighting apes and tigers will die all in good time in the course of natural evolution, but they will not die so long as the cowardly, somnambulistic apes and tigers club and scratch and slash. This is not a brief for the prize-fighter. It is a blow of the fist between the eyes of the somnambulists, teetering up and down, muttering magic phrases, and thanking God that they are not as other animals. Glen Ellen, California, June 1900 End of The Somnambulists from Revolution and Other Essays by Jack London Appendix Taxation From Essays on the Trial by Jury by Lysander Spooner This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essay on the Trial by Jury Appendix Taxation by Lysander Spooner It was a principle of the common law, as it is of the law of nature and of common sense, that no man can be taxed without his personal consent. The common law knew nothing of that system which now prevails in England, of assuming a man's own consent to be taxed, because some pretended representative, whom he never authorized to act for him, has taken it upon himself to consent that he may be taxed. That is one of the many frauds on the common law and the English Constitution which have been introduced since Magna Carta. Having finally established itself in England, it has been stupidly and severely copied and submitted to in the United States. If the trial by jury were re-established, the common law principle of taxation would be re-established with it for it is not to be supposed that juries would enforce a tax upon an individual which he had never agreed to pay. Taxation without consent is as plainly robbery when enforced against one man as when enforced against millions, and it is not to be imagined that juries could be blind to so self-evident a principle, taking a man's money without his consent, is also as much robbery, when it is done by millions of men acting in concert and calling themselves a government, as when it is done by a single individual acting on his own responsibility and calling himself a highwayman. Neither the numbers engaged in the act, nor the different characters they assume as a cover for the act, alter the nature of the act itself. If the government can take a man's money without his consent, there is no limit to the additional tyranny it may practice upon him. For with his money, it can hire soldiers to stand over him, keep him in subjection, 
plunder him at discretion, and kill him if he resists. And governments always will do this, as they everywhere and always have done it, except where the common law principle has been established. It is therefore a first principle, a very sine qua non of political freedom, that a man can be taxed only by his personal consent. And the establishment of this principle with trial by jury ensures freedom of course. Because, one, no man would pay his money unless he had first contracted for such a government as he was willing to support. And, two, unless the government then kept itself within the terms of its contract, juries would not enforce the payment of the tax. Besides, the agreement to be taxed would probably be entered into but for a year at a time. If in that year the government proved itself either ineffectual or tyrannical to any serious degree, the contract would not be renewed. The dissatisfied parties, if sufficiently numerous for a new organization, would form themselves into a separate association for mutual protection. If not sufficiently numerous for that purpose, those who were conscientious would forego all governmental protection rather than contribute to the support of a government which they deemed unjust. All legitimate government is a mutual insurance company, voluntarily agreed upon by the parties to it, for the protection of their rights against wrongdoers. In its voluntary character, it is precisely similar to an association for mutual protection against fire or shipwreck. Before a man will join an association for these latter purposes and pay the premium for being insured he will, if he be a man of sense, look at the articles of the association, see what the company promises to do, what it is likely to do, and what are the rates of insurance. If he be satisfied on all these points, he will become a member, pay his premium for a year, and then hold the company to its contract. If the conduct of the company prove unsatisfactory, he will let his policy expire at the end of the year for which he has paid, will decline to pay any further premiums, and either seek insurance elsewhere or take his own risk without any insurance. And as men act in the insurance of their ships and dwellings, they would act in the insurance of their properties, liberties, and lives in the political association or government. The political insurance company or government have no more right in nature or reason to assume a man's consent to be protected by them and to be taxed for that protection when he has given no actual consent than a fire or marine insurance company have to assume a man's consent to be protected by them and to pay the premium when his actual consent has never been given. To take a man's property without his consent is robbery, and to assume his consent where no actual consent is given makes the taking none the less robbery. If it did, the highwayman has the same right to assume a man's consent to part with his purse that any other man or body of men can have and his assumption would afford as much moral justification for his robbery as does a like assumption on the part of the government, for taking a man's property 
without his consent. The government's pretense for protecting him as an equivalent for the taxation affords no justification. It is for himself to decide whether he desires such protection as the government offers him. If he do not desire it or do not bargain for it, the government has no more right than any other insurance company to impose it upon him or make him pay for it. Trial by the country and no taxation without consent were the two pillars of English liberty, when England had any liberty, and the first principles of the common law. They mutually sustain each other, and neither can stand without the other. Without both, no people have any guarantee for their freedom. With both, no people can be otherwise than free. Footnote 1 Footnote 1. Trial by the country and no taxation without consent mutually sustain each other and can be sustained only by each other for these reasons. 1. Juries would refuse to enforce a tax against a man who had never agreed to pay it. They would also protect men in forcibly resisting the collection of taxes to which they had never consented. Otherwise, the jurors would authorize the government to tax themselves without their consent, a thing which no jury would be likely to do. In these two ways, then, trial by the country would sustain the principle of no taxation without consent. 2. On the other hand, the principle of no taxation without consent would sustain the trial by the country, because men in general would not consent to be taxed for the support of a government under which trial by the country was not secured. Thus these two principles mutually sustain each other. But if either of these principles were broken down, the other would fall with it, and for these reasons, if trial by the country were broken down, the principle of no taxation without consent would fall with it, because the government would then be able to tax the people without their consent, inasmuch as the legal tribunals would be mere tools of the government, and would enforce such taxation, and punish men for resisting such taxation, as the government ordered. On the other hand, if the principle of no taxation without consent were broken down, trial by the country would fall with it, because the government, if it could tax people, without their consent, would of course take enough of their money to enable it to employ all the force necessary for sustaining its own tribunals in the place of juries, and carry their decrees into execution. By what force fraud and conspiracy on the part of kings, nobles, and Quote, a few wealthy freeholders, end quote. These pillars have been prostrated in England. It is desired to show more fully in the next volume, if it should be necessary. End of Appendix Taxation by Lysander Spooner Recording by Robert Scott Mojo Move four one one dot com M O J O M O V E four one one dot com August the twenty first two thousand and seven This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness Why Are All Men Gamblers? by Arthur Brisbane The annual report of the gambling house at Monte Carlo shows a profit of about five million dollars. A large collection of human beings travel from all parts of the world to Monte Carlo for the sake of giving five million dollars to the gambling concern there. Wherever you look on earth today or in the past, you find human beings gambling, and you will find the gambling instinct stronger than any other, stronger than the love of drink, infinitely stronger than the love of normal, honest gain. Christopher Columbus's sailors gambled on the way over, and the Indians on this side were gambling while waiting to be discovered. In an office overlooking Trinity Graveyard in New York City, an old man, past eighty, with a fortune of at least fifty million dollars, gambles every day with all the excitement of youth. The fluctuations in his game bring to his sallow cheeks the color that no other human emotion could bring there. On his way home, this old man passes crowds of children in the streets and looks down, concerned and sorrowful, to find that they too are gambling. They are matching pennies or shaking dice. Clergymen are startled and amazed to find that women are gambling heavily. They have gambled heavily ever since civilization has progressed far enough to give them large sums to gamble with. Marie Antoinette staked thousands of louis at a time at Versailles. She was so wrapped up in gambling she could not see that her neck was in danger. When the lava came down from Vesuvius it buried Pompeians who were gambling. The men who dig up the old monuments in Africa find gambling instruments crumbling away side by side with appliances for taking human life. Nowhere in the lower forms of animal life, so far as we know, is there the slightest indication of the gambling instinct. The monkey, the elephant, love whiskey and easily become drunkards. The passion for alcohol seems innate in animal life. Even the wise ant can be readily induced to disgrace himself if alcohol is put near him. For all the human weaknesses and mainsprings, ambition, affection, vanity, drunkenness, ferocity, greediness, cunning, we can find beginnings among the lower animals. But man appears to have evolved from within himself the gambling instinct for his own especial damnation. Where did the instinct come from? Why was it planted in us? Like every other instinct with which intelligent nature endows us, it must have its good purposes, and it must not be judged merely in the corrupted form in which we study it at Monte Carlo or in Wall Street. Perhaps the spirit of gambling is really only an atrophied, perverted form of the spirit of adventure. Columbus staked his life and gambled when he started across the water. The leaders of the American Revolution expressly staked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, in signing the Declaration of Independence. They were noble gamblers working for the welfare of their fellows. Perhaps gambling is only a perverted form of intelligent ambition. We are all natural gamblers because we have within us the quality which makes us willing to risk our own comfort, security, and present happiness for a result that seems better worth while. The universality of the gambling instinct in human beings is certainly worthy of our study. End of Why Are All Men Gamblers by Arthur Brisbane Recorded by Brian Ness